بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آواز آ رہی اوکے سو بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم تھینک یو ویری مچ آئی ایم ڈاکٹر عثمان حسن آئی ایم کنسلٹنٹ ہسٹو پیتھالوجسٹ اینڈ ہیڈ آف پیتھالوجی شاکت خان کینسر ہاسپٹل سو آئی ویلکم یو آل ٹو دس ویبینار آف کووڈ نائنٹین پیتھالوجی لیبارٹری آئی ہوپ دا پارٹیسپینٹس ول جوائن ان ایز اے ٹائم پاسز سو دا تھیم آف دس ایکچولی ویبینار از ہاؤ ڈفرینٹ سیکشنز آف پیتھالوجی ڈیل ود دس پینڈیمک and we have been able to bring very rare sub specialties of pathology in this webinar and their importance cannot be overemphasized like immunology virology clinical hematology and molecular uh, they have to team up actually and perform very well in this pandemic so i must thank dr uh, sajid mushtaq who has actually uh, requested all the speakers to come and present at this webinar so without wasting any time further i would like to invite my first speaker she is dr subin khurshid zaidi she is a clinical virologist and pathologist having more than 17 years experience in pathology especially in microbiology sections and her interest is main interest in disease control and prevention she is fellow of uh, college of pathology of pakistan and also fellow of royal college of pathology uk and presently she is working as associate professor of pathology at Karachi Institute of Medical Sciences thank you very much dr sabi so you can just start and uh, every speaker has 20 minutes and we will take question and answer session at the end of this webinar presentation so dr sabi please bismillahir rahmanir rahim i hope you can hear me and uh, you can see my slides yeah, awesome. okay awesome. بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کین یو ہیئر می کلیئرلی یس اوکے اینڈ آر مائی سلائڈس کلیئرلی ویزیبل آن دی انٹرفیس So uh, without much ado, I'd like to start off. First of all, I'd really, I'm very grateful uh, to be addressing such an August uh, forum on um, uh, such an important topic. So I'm going to cover the challenge of hospital-acquired COVID, uh, which is, I think, really uh, something which uh, we all need to do through a multi-pronged approach. I report no conflict of interest or with any private or public organization. And the outline of my uh, presentation includes uh, transmission of SARS-CoV-2, defining hospital acquisition on outbreaks, and the various challenges including contact tracing, uh, COVID, non-COVID pathway definitions, how to follow safe patient care, PPE challenges, test, uh, and obviously lab testing challenges, lab safety, a bit of lab safety, environmental cleaning challenges, and uh, hospital ventilation challenges. So why I actually chose this topic is because we know that uh, maybe certain healthcare facilities have got individual surveillance systems in picking up these hospital acquired COVID infections. And uh, from this news report, we know that many of our frontline workers, including paramedics and doctors have actually succumbed uh, to this uh, deadly disease. And uh, although um, we don't clearly know that how much of hospital setting actually contributed to the disease in this cohort, uh, or was it mostly uh, community transmission? So a bit about SARS-CoV-2, um, it's an enveloped RNA virus, and it belongs to the hazard group 3 pathogen, meaning so there isn't really any vaccine or any, uh, so far, any treatment for this particular pathogen. And uh, so far, there's been debate about uh, its transmission regarding it being airborne or not. So it's, it is clear that it is droplet, Um, large respiratory droplets and also through contact indirectly from fomites. But it, you can call it an opportunistic airborne when there are aerosol generating procedures in healthcare uh, uh, facilities with droplet nuclei uh, being suspended in the air and causing you know, transmission. So it's not classically an airborne pathogen. And the reason, uh, the argument for that is that the attack rate is not like chickenpox or measles. Uh, the secondary attack rate, 
And uh, secondly, um, uh, you know, uh, it, had it been airborne, it would have been more like tuberculosis or like measles. But it's you could call it opportunistically airborne. Then another issue with this virus is its stability in the environment uh, on hard surfaces, on non-porous surfaces. And something that's really come up now about patients who are infected, for how long do they shed it? So uh, a certain studies have shown that up to eight days post infection after that, it's really very, very difficult to, uh, you know, recover viable virus. So it's actually uh, a gray area over there. Uh, that whether what you're detecting on a molecular level at a PCR is actually viable virus or just dead viral particles. So uh, what's really important to know is the six feet rule. So if somebody coughs, I mean the large respiratory droplets, they can enter the mouth, uh, mouth, mouth nose and eyes. And um, obviously there are certain high risk procedures like intubation and bronchoscopy in healthcare settings that lead to transmission if proper uh, personal protective equip uh, equipment is not worn, and then obviously fomite transmission from high touch surfaces. Now, uh, there have been uh, quite a lot of studies about uh, specific to SARS-CoV-2 um, on its survival in the environment, but so far so good. The transmission is mainly, you know, airborne, is mainly droplet mediated. So there may be a role of fomite transmission uh, by touching contaminated areas. But these droplets, they, uh, the virus that, that, that's present in these droplets, it depends on the humidity, the type of surface, the temperature for how long it would remain viable. So it's about roughly up to three to seven days. Um, so colder the temperature, less the temperature, it's going to survive more. And it tends to decay after, you know, above 56 degrees centigrade. And then uh, there was a large study which was conducted by researchers at University um, uh, College London NHS Trust, and they actually, uh, what they did in UK was that they, um, you know, they sampled areas uh, in the vicinity of COVID patients, and uh, they also tried to culture, and they did a PCR as well. So what they find out, found out was that what they detected in PCR was detected as a very higher cycle threshold, and they could not culture any of the virus in the environment. But still, we need to, this does not mean that we need to do away with high touch environmental cleaning. So why is it that this particular virus has spread so quickly? Why is it, I mean, why doesn't influenza spread the way uh, COVID-19 has? So the main reason is because of, uh, there's a major terminology that we should know, the R0, the basic reproduction number. So for this particular virus, one person can infect about three to four people, but while uh, one person who's infected with influenza tends to infect about 1.3 persons. So with five transmission cycles, one person who's got influenza would about infect 45 people. In comparison to COVID, uh, they would infect 345 pay, uh, people. So this is why it's so contagious and it's spread. And then if you have a look at this diagram, you know that the average incubation period or the median incubation period is five days with a range of two to 14 days. And um, what's really, you know, this particular virus, the epidemiology is a bit different from flu. Although uh, you tend to be infectious in flu about 24 hours before. But for this, it's about roughly about three to four days before onset of symptoms. You may set, shed the virus, this is the pre-symptomatic phase, and uh, you may continue to shed it for up to about 10, um, 10 days. And uh, as I mentioned before, that beyond eight days, viable virus was not found. And then there's a large cohort of patients who are actually asymptomatic. So we're calling it the Achilles heel of the current strategies to control COVID-19 because these asymptomatic people actually don't develop symptoms. But it would be plausible to say that because they're not sneezing or coughing or producing large droplets, so the risk may be slightly less as compared to people who are transmitting it through symptoms. But however, when they speak or, you know, um, it's shown through studies like uh, speaking or uh, being very within six uh, uh, feet of uh, these people or to very close contact household settings, they can transmit. And there were quite a few studies in uh, um, nursing care homes and resident care facilities in USA in which they did uh, cross-sectional prevalence studies by actually culturing the virus and also, uh, you know, looking for it through the PCR. And they found out that a, a 
large, vast majority of these individuals were asymptomatic, and some of them, they went on to develop symptoms as well, and um, some remained asymptomatic. So this is why it's so hard to control, and when you have an outbreak in a healthcare setting, you'd be, you know, uh, contact tracing everybody and then uh, swabbing people who may even be asymptomatic uh, for intensive, uh, you know, um, contact tracing. Now, another issue with this is that uh, as compared to SARS-CoV-2, in SARS-CoV-1, uh, um, uh, patients usually developed high viral loads very late into infection. But for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 disease, these patients have a quite a high viral load during early infection. And that's, you know, when they're more likely to be transmissible. And that's also one of the reasons that it's really, you know, um, become a pandemic and it's spread all over. And it's hard to control. So in, in the context of healthcare facilities, um, you know, putting in contingency plans and controlling um, nosocomial outbreaks, we need to, you know, know what where our community stands. Is it limited community transmission? Is it moderate or I'd say widespread like it is now? So um, uh, this actually affects our, our contingency, contingency plans and uh, the aspect of contact tracing in PPE. For example, in widespread community uh, transmission in healthcare facilities, you'd want everyone to do universal masking. You'd want all your healthcare providers to actually wear eye protection as well if they're within six feet, uh, feet of a person or a patient that they're actually evaluating and looking. So how do we define, um, you know, hospital onset and hospital acquired COVID infection? So these are two different terms. You will encounter patients or even staff in your facility who may come up with a symptomatic COVID, say if they come up before uh, five to seven days, so it may be likely that they acquired it from the community. But if they've been admitted for a prolonged time and they come up with COVID and they've been diagnosed in your facility, then uh, usually you can take the five day cutoff. Uh, after that, then you you really need to investigate whether they, they got it from the healthcare facility. And obviously, uh, in both cases, you need to carry out investigation for contact tracing. So these are like hospital onset and hospital acquired infections. These are surveillance definitions for the infection control team in your hospital to actually, um, you know, get back to the root of the problem that did an event occur in your facility through which uh, this particular outbreak, that is two or more cases occurred linked in time, place and person. So what is the response when we detect these new COVID-19 infections in the hospital setting? So the response will depend on the circumstances. Uh, what's going on with the patient? Is it a single case? And you know, Ideally, uh, facilities have to define COVID and non-COVID pathways. And there's a bit of ethics involved in that as well, because I, you know, through personal experience, there are certain facilities that say, get a COVID test done and then we'll attend to you. We need to know your COVID uh, you know, status. So the issue is that for emergency care and for non-COVID interventions, we need to make a, uh, have a plan in place in which we can actually give that provided care to that patient in isolation until we're actually waiting for their screening results. And, you know, uh, in intense community settings, we need to uh, institute all the infection uh, prevention precautions that we would do with a COVID case or a suspected COVID case, because we don't want an outbreak in our hospital setting. So case investigation and contact tracing, how long do you go back? What's the uh, exposure period? So as per WHO and CDC USA, so you actually go back, you've got a case index case of COVID on your ward. So you need to investigate at least 48 hours uh, before the onset of that index case's symptoms um, till then when, till they are isolated. To who has been exposed to them and what counts as an exposure? So a high risk exposure would definitely be them not wearing PPE when caring for the patient um, or a PPE breach when caring for the patient or performing an AGP aerosol generating procedure without proper PPE. And secondly, uh, even for visitors or other contacts, at least 15 minutes or more face to face contact uh, within, you know, um, uh, six feet of that patient. So you really need to risk assess on who is a high risk contact and who is not, because that's going to, uh, you know, determine your plan of action. So this is one of my favorite diagrams that I've taken from the hierarchy of controls CDC. If you have a look at this hierarchy, 
PPE actually lies at the bottom of this hierarchy, but it's very important nevertheless. When we talk of elimination in the healthcare setting, we're actually trying to screen out patients and healthcare workers. And this screening would include both history taking, symptomatic checks, epidemiological context. Do they have a COVID positive household member? Have they been in contact with one? What symptoms do they have? Are they running a temperature? So all of these are screening strategies to actually um, you know, eliminate the hazard. But you can't obviously practically do it all the time. And neither can you substitute your patients or your health workers all the time. So most important are engineering controls, the way your facility is set up, which we'll discuss later on, the administrative controls, what are your procedures and your processes, and of course, PPE. So I'm really going to, you know, this diagram, uh, if you have a look, when you're, you know, discussing hospital acquired COVID and prevention of nosocomial COVID, you need to take into mind your testing, where the testing is done, how it's done, the patient pathways, the reduction in transmission, uh, environmental measures, cleaning, how frequent it is, role of housekeeping, uh, isolation, cohort base, and PPE, contingency plans, shortage, reuse, extended use, and of course, most important, hand hygiene and standard precautions. So what is the COVID testing focus? Would you just randomly go and screen each and every person in your facility? So you can do directed screening. I mean, screening would not just include testing, it would include history taking, epidemiological workup, or who they've been in contact with in the last 14 days. And obviously, when there's an outbreak, you'd go for screening all high risk contacts. And you know, you need to know um, uh, in the USA, for example, where in nursing homes there were outbreaks, there's still, uh, until the outbreak has died out, which they can find out from their you know, data and their surveillance systems, they continue to uh, screen weekly, on a weekly basis, asymptomatic health, uh, health staff. So it depends on your resources and your policy, how you go about that. But the main crux of that is actually to identify, uh, test, you know, detect, trace, isolate, and you know, exclude from high risk areas specifically. So, uh, and then there's the human resource aspect of this as well, because when you're, you've got intensive community transmission, you will, may not be able to, uh, you know, quarantine each and every healthcare worker. So what do you do then? At that point of time, you need to do a risk assessment of where they work and then uh, source control. That when they are actually working and if they are in, uh, you know, maybe incubating, where are they working and whether they're wearing a mask and, uh, you know, practice and whether they have been counseled that if they develop symptoms, they get themselves tested ASP and exclude from work. So should we screen all staff and patients routinely? So obviously for symptomatic contacts and symptomatic patients you, and healthcare workers, you work. But then there are certain loopholes, um, you know, regarding the testing. Um, when the prevalence in the community dis, uh, declines, uh, the test may have a poor positive predictive value. Then there are also issues with uh, false negatives as well. So it needs to be, um, uh, you know, the test result has to be interpreted with clinical judgment. And even if somebody is symptomatic and they come back negative with a PCR test on a respiratory sample, uh, maybe a nas nasopharyngeal swab, you may want to repeat it again. Uh, you know, just to be sure, and uh, if, if they fit into the clinical case definition, you would want to isolate them and not, uh, you know, uh, do unsafe practice of exposing them to other patients and healthcare workers. So it all depends on your resources and uh, the intensity of the transmission going on and, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the context of where that particular healthcare worker works. So certain, some patients, you know, when there's community transmission, some patients are going to come back for readmissions due to various reasons. And, um, you know, ever since uh, people were adopting the uh, uh, testing strategy, uh, which mean, uh, means that they were using uh, swabbing, uh, negative swabs for PCR, uh, two swabs 24 hours apart to do away with de-isolation. But now we've come back to the non-testing strategy, uh, which is actually symptoms or I mean, for asymptomatic patients. So um, if somebody comes back to your facility and they're still they've still got a positive PCR report, they're asymptomatic, otherwise they've recovered clinically, what do you do? So 
you should ideally manage them in the COVID pathway, just to, you know, in the protected pathway. But we would still consider the risk of transmission low at that time, because as I mentioned, that after some time, about more than a 10 days or so, uh, a viable virus has not been cultured. And secondly, these patients have recovered clinically. So what, what would you do, um, you know, uh, what is the multi-pronged approach? So in the beginning, we were delaying all elective procedures, but you can't do that forever, can you? We reschedule elective and non-urgent admissions. We may delay inpatient and outpatient elective. Use telemedicine. Uh, but really, what do you do when you need to go up and about with your healthcare facility, open up your OPDs? So you need to, first of all, limit exposures to visitors. The visitor policy has to be very robust. Uh, there are certain administrative controls you can put in, like visitors can, you know, uh, physical distancing between chairs, they can wait in parking lots. So, you know, visitors are also risks uh, for the healthcare facility in terms of them being asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, uh, you know, carriers of this uh, infected with this virus. So, how do you maximize work practice controls? So, you exclude visitors and non-essential workers, um, you know, uh, limit face-to-face -face encounters uh, of healthcare providers with patients, uh, make teams provide required education, training, PPE, and con contingency planning. So there are three main, uh, for patient flows, there are three main parts that you need to look up to prior to the arrival of the patient, on the arrival of the patient, and after the arrival of the patient. So limit exposure before the arrival of the patient by using digital technology, emails, internet, application, postures, and basically virtual triage via telehealth, which meaning so that Patients should have access to all these, uh, you know, facilities without having to visit uh, the hospital unless necessary. Then when the patient arrives, you need to have robust screening in terms of history taking, in terms of temperature evaluations, and where you do it is very important, segregated. Um, what about asymptomatic patients, how you need to follow them up? And I think the need of the time now is source control, universal mask. Asking, limiting droplet dispersal via masks for these patients who visit your facility. And after arrival, you need to limit patient, patient transport. And uh, again, you need to do source control. And for the pre-symptomatic patient, any patient who's come for any other reason may be pre-symptomatic. So they need to be evaluated at least on a daily basis for whether or not they've developed symptoms which are compatible with COVID and they need isolation and uh, immediate institution of transmission-based precautions. So in the beginning, we were more onto respiratory etiquette, picking up patients who've actually got symptoms, but now because of the epidemiology, we're more onto source control etiquette during intensive uh, community transmission, which means that your patient has to wear a mask, the visitors have to wear a mask, then necessarily uh, they have to come in like in NICUs or places where, you know, uh, maybe the parent has to come in and they have to be masked and wearing proper PPE. So you need to shift your focus, uh, uh, um, you know, more onto source control etiquette as well. And another, because I have uh, limited time, I'm not really going to go on to the complete uh, details of PPE, but what's important is PPE competency and training. It has to be continued even after the post-COVID era. If you have a look at the PPE uh, recommendations in this table, you can see that there's a comparator between the European Union, the WHO, ECDC, and CDC. But we know uh, that what's very important is that at least for aerosol generating procedures, an N95 respirator is a must, along with the other you know, uh, PPE equipment, the face uh, protections, the goggles and face shields, and the gowns. And uh, we need to uh, follow our local and um, national policy regarding PPE. Another uh, you know, um, uh, dilemma that we've been seeing is these valve masks. These are N95 uh, respirators, which are called valves. So as you can see in the picture, the individual who's wearing the valve mask is actually protected. But when they exhale, if they're pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, they would be shedding the virus and not protecting others. So these valve masks are not really recommended in healthcare settings. And for example, if you are run out of masks and the valve mask is the only uh, you know, uh, uh, thing you've got uh, for mitigation. So, uh, I mean, what do you do? So you can wear a face shield, 
uh, it would somewhat mitigate the risk, but ideally you should not be using valve masks because you're not going to be providing source control or protection to others. Your exhaled air is going to contain numerous millions of viral particles, infectious viral particles, if you're pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic or even symptomatic. Standardization of PPE. So I've been going through this and I've seen these cover all models. What I uh, seem to you know, decipher is that it, what's really important is the comfort of the PPE. Uh, whether you, you know, it's comfortable, it's easy to don and doff and um, excessive PPE can lead to, you know, problems. It can lead to, in fact, contamination. Excess, so it should be optimal. And these coveralls, one needs to be trained how to remove the coveralls without getting themselves contaminated. Because you see, if it's in two pieces, it may be easier to remove. But obviously, uh, the coverall uh, may be contaminated and uh, you need to perform hand hygiene while removing each piece of PPE. So this is something I wanted to share. This was a, uh, one of my colleagues at Sheffield. She did a pro uh, project with the Health Services uh, HSE executive in which they did this simulation with a mannequin violet, visualizing infection with optimized light for education and training. And they did these simulations with body fluids, including cough, which you can see in the lower uh, right picture, red. So they found out that maximum amount of contamination occurred through doffing. And this is what they saw, that if doffing is not done properly, uh, it's going to contaminate you and it's going to put you at risk of getting infected. Then AGPs. So AGPs are actually what we mean to say is that these are small droplet nuclei which have got viral particles, right? So it depends where the aerosol is coming from. So it's coming from the respiratory tract, greater the risk. Aerosol generating procedures, this is the list. There's an exhaustive list um, which uh, is available, Public Health England, intubation, CPR, upper GI endoscopy, many others. But I wanted to share this table from the Royal College of uh, Speech and Language in which they've compared that what may be an AGP for the WHO uh, may not be for some other country. But we need to follow our own policy and we know that it, it, it's understood that intubation, extubation, open suctioning, tracheostomy, bronchoscopy, uh, CPR are actually AGPs and we need to, uh, you know, uh, accordingly we need to wear the PPE, the N95 respirators, and uh, ideally these should be done in negative pressure rooms or airborne isolation rooms, but these are not available in our country. So a well-ventilated room with a closed door, um, I mean, we need to follow our local policy for that. And um, so limiting exposure is key. So you can use other containment strategies like ventilated headboards. These are actually headboards which have got HEPA filters where the exhaled air, the patient is actually filtered. And then these are these boxes in which you can do intubation, extubation, and limit actually exposure. So these are various engineering controls that can be put in place. And um, basically you need to know, you need to work with the estates or the engineers in terms of the number of air exchanges in the room in which you're doing an AGP. And um, obviously we don't have negative pressure everywhere in all of our healthcare facilities. So if it's normal, I mean ventilation, open the windows, close the door, do the AGP, enter after one hour, uh, uh, the basic room, when, uh, when the uh, air aerosols have actually settled and make sure that whoever cleans enters with full respiratory protective PPE to clean um, after some time when the air has been diluted. So these are some very safety points that we need to take home. And what are the other ventilation challenges? Uh, so it really depends. Uh, I mean, if you are actually sampling somebody uh, in the outpatients, uh, patients one after another in a closed room, or maybe you're doing it in a COVID ward, that's not right. You need to do it in a separate area, preferably in a you know uh, vent well ventilated area. Uh, in fact, uh, in one of the facilities, primary care facilities, uh, they were doing this outside in, a, in tents. Um, and obviously there's this sunlight coming in and there's a lot of ventilation. So uh, less likely that you get concentrated aerosols there. Then coming to the extended and limited reuse of respirators. Uh, these are two different terms. Extended means that you don't uh, take it off. You use it for multiple patient encounters without doffing it. And reuse means that you actually take it off and then reuse it. So with reuse, there is a potential for you know, contaminating yourself. Uh, if you touch the front of the contaminated respirator, this is N95 respirators. So 
basically the major risk of reusing these respirators is actually contact transmission. And this can not only be from SARS-CoV-2, it may be from other MDRs, C. difficile or MRSA, MRSA. So what's the best strategy is actually you need to discard N95 respirators following use during AGPs. And uh, if they're contaminated, if they're not properly fitting, and uh, you need to, uh, there are certain uh, uh, risk mitigation strategies. So what does the CDC recommend? You could use a mask rotation strategy in which each healthcare worker is issued with up to five masks and not to use the mask uh, reused for more than five times. And how do you store it in a breathable bag or hang it and uh, you discard it if it's visibly contaminated or after an AGP and you do not uh, use the uh, respirators between individuals. It's for yourself to use. Um, then there, there's a lot of research going on about reprocessing hydrogen peroxide. There are various commercial systems, UV treatment. And uh, mind you, bleach, alcohol, uh, uh, you know, baking, boiling, microwaving are not actually approved. So these ones are investigational, H2O2 vaporization, UV treatment, these have got these critical control points and um, you may not want to do it at home uh, because it's not standardized. So then the facility, uh, what kind of disinfectant do you use? Local policy, bleach is ideal, 0.1%, one minute contact time, do not mix products, uh, fo uh, follow uh, you know, the manufacturer's guidelines, and uh, you need to uh, actually uh, disinfect all high touch surfaces. What's going to be your frequency? Three times in 24 hours, terminal clean cleaning after discharge of the patient, um, and uh, after AGPs, uh, depending on the air exchange rate. And don't neglect soft surfaces. So these have to be, and also laundry, because we know that Laundry has to be done um, at a higher temperature, about 60 degrees hot water, uh, to get rid of the virus. And then we come on to lab safety, which is the last portion of my uh, presentation, uh, because labs are obviously a part of the hospital. And, uh, you know, it's a category three agent, but it depends on the type of sample you're actually dealing with. So if you're dealing with a sample in VTM, you're going to have viable virus. And when you're doing all the pre-analytical work before adding it into the lysis buffer, lysis buffer is is a portion of, um, you know, if during extraction, if you, uh, it has got this chemical, uh, gonadinum isothiocyanate, which actually, um, it, uh, you know, deactivates the virus. So before that, you need to do everything in a microbiological safety cabinet, class two biological safety cabinet. And any kind of aerosols have to be generating procedures in the lab, have to be done within that biosafety cabinet. And um, uh, obviously, you need to know the risk of the procedure you're doing. So if you're doing neutralization with live virus, you need nothing less than bios uh, biosafety level three. But most of our routine diagnostic labs are biosafety level two. So you would be, uh, you can do molecular testing as we phenomenally rolled out molecular testing in Pakistan. Uh, but uh, everybody got hold of biosafety cabinets and, you know, everybody's been trained with that, I hopefully. And um, so the host uh, who's at risk is actually the lab worker. Their training, competency, understanding the risk is very important. And when we look at the lab, most of the uh, uh, diagnostic labs are BSL-2. And um, obviously, uh, you'd need a biosafety cabinet to do molecular work with this virus. So um, uh, when we're talking about uh, samples uh, that have been transported to you, if they've been double bagged, uh, you need to look inside um, uh, safely, donning off a mask, respirator. Uh, if you're doing aerosol generating procedures, it has to be N95 and it has to be done under a biosafety cabinet um, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, do safe work. Um, so uh, there is, there are certain contingencies and certain risk mitigation strategies like using transport media that contain lysis buffer. So when you take the sample, you're actually just going to inactivate the virus there and then, but the uh, RNA is going to be there and present for molecular work. So, uh, you know, viral RNA is found in a host of samples. It's been detected in feces, in urine, in blood, uh, negligible though, uh, in CSF, but mostly it's uh, in the respiratory samples that are the high risk samples. Um, regarding feces, there have been mixed studies, whether this viable or non-viable virus. So still a word of caution when you're dealing with fecal samples from these patients, best to use a biosafety cabinet. 
Risk is low unless the procedure generates aerosols, which includes vigorous pipetting, vortexing. Um, open bench work is discouraged. You need to do it in a biosafety cabinet. And uh, remember that uh, you need to have your procedures in place for high risk surface disinfection, whether or not you're using bleach or some other disinfecting that is approved. So what are the viral inactivation strategies? OK, this is the last slide. Um, you can as uh, you can see that this is uh, you could use lysis buffer and you can do heat uh, inactivation. And uh, what's important is that if you're using gynadinium based lysis buffer, you do not use bleach as a disinfectant. So this is all for today. Um, sorry for the rush through because of the paucity of the time. And I presume that we're going to have a question answer session um, at the end. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Dr. Sabine, right. for I'm giving unsure. us your virologist perspective regarding this pandemic. So, our next speaker is Dr. Tahir Aziz Ahmed. He's a professor of immunology. He's one of the leading immunologists of this country, and he has chaired the Department of Immunology at AFIP Rawalpindi for 10 years and has been able to develop in the state of the art uh, department. Currently, he's working as professor of immunology at Shifa International Hospital. And he is actually country advisor of Royal College of Pathology UK. So he is FCPS in immunology as well as FRC Path in immunology, has 67 publications and two book chapters to his name. So I would like to invite him for the next talk, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. And he will be talking about immune response to COVID-19. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, Apo Vazari. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Yes, sir, please. Yes, sir. Vazari, Apo. Yes, sir. Okay, or uh, slides we share, Hori. Not yet. Bini Hori. Hello. Not yet, sir. Okay, I'm going to share it. Here we are. Yes, sir. Abhori? Yes, sir. Thank you. Abhori, how are you doing? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, Dr. Qasim. And uh, I would like to thank Giri uh, Sajid um, Mushtaq, my teacher and friend, uh, for uh, creating this webinar and providing us uh, this opportunity, and especially uh, providing me the opportunity to discuss immune response, uh, one of my most favorite topics. And today I would be discussing immune response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, I have listened to Dr. Sabin uh, with pleasure. Uh, uh, what a marvelous talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabine. Uh, the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 is extremely important. Uh, this virus is most well-known virus at the moment, um, at present on this planet. And here on the right side, I have uh, projected a, a scanning electron micrograph of a human epithelial cell, which is infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses. So, uh, this this is kind of number of viruses which can uh, which goes after a single cell. This virus is extremely successful. Started as a zoonosis, uh, and we knew uh, about the first patient somewhere starting from December. Uh, started off from China, and now we know that it has spread all over the world. 
So what from this slide, what we need to uh, know that uh, there is a successful animal model where immunopathology can be studied. This virus is extremely contagious. It multiplies very rapidly. And in the past six months, uh, second July figures, uh, the total number of uh, confirmed uh, patients infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 have crossed uh, 10.5 million with a, an overall uh, mortality rate of around 5%. So that's a disease uh, which spreads rapidly and get, can cause uh, extreme uh, illness uh, requiring intensive care uh, intensive care for about 20% of the infected patients and about 5% of them uh, may die. For Pakistan, we have figures uh, having a case fatality rate of around 2%. For the past week, uh, we have had some good news. Uh, the fresh cases, uh, the fresh infections being reported on a daily basis in Pakistan has been, this particular rate has been coming down and uh, we hope that uh, this, this trend would continue. Now the virus after infection may cause a limited disease, may cause a subclinical disease in about 80% of the individuals, but in rest of the 20%, uh, it may cause a severe disease and about 5% may die. And the system in human body, which is there to control the infection is the immune system. So the immune system is interested with the uh, heavy responsibility in this case uh, to control infection by a very highly infectious virus which multiplies rapidly. The immune system has different components uh, at, at its disposal and these are phagocytes. Just to recap, phagocytes uh, and lymphocytes, T lymphocytes and D lymphocytes and D lymphocytes differentiate into plasma cells to produce uh, protein molecules called antibodies. And all of these different components of immune system work in an organized manner to control this infection. So what we hope to learn from uh, today's discussion is the critical components of the immune response to infection with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, these components make the difference between a limited disease or a severe disease. We need to know immunopathology to devise effective diagnosis, prognosis and treatment. And we dream about an effective vaccine which is safe and provides a long lasting immunity. And the, uh, the manufacture and the formulation of such a vaccine would depend on our understanding of the immune mechanisms which are important in providing the protection. Now these immune mechanisms are available in the form of two groups. We know that there are innate or non-specific immune mechanisms, and then there are specific uh, adaptive immune mechanisms. Now, the innate immune mechanisms and adaptive immune mechanisms are available in the form of barriers, cells, and their protein products. Now, the innate immune mechanism is unique. Uh, we usually don't look at this component as the very important component of the immune response but it is really the most important and the critical component in response to infections, especially infections by viruses, highly uh, contagious disease produced by SARS-CoV-2 infections. So th this immune system has to respond immediately. It is there for all kinds of threats. So the immune system has to differentiate the threats from the host own tissues. Most important function of the immune system is to differentiate between self and non-self. Now, for this purpose, the immune system has different receptors to differentiate between self and non-self. And once it identifies something as non-self, it, it gets activated. And once it is activated, it produces its effective mechanisms to control the infection. The virus itself, um, the most well-known picture, uh, there are spike proteins uh, for the coronavirus and it has an uh, RNA genome, uh, envelope protein, hemagglutinins, and membrane protein. The virus gains entry inside the cell using uh, ACE2 receptors. The virus 
select proteins combined with the receptors, and this complex is internalized in the form of an endosome, uh, endosome having the part of cell membrane. So in this endosome, the viral components are, uh, are acted upon by a protease, which is also present on the cell surface. It is taken in in the endosome with the action of that protease, the virus uh, components are able to fuse with the membrane here in the endosome, that is one. And this process facilitates viral entry into the cytoplasm of the cell. But there is another interaction. This membrane also has toll like receptors, TLRs, and these TLRs recognize the viral structural proteins and genome, and they interact with it. And the TLR viral component interaction activates pathways, uh, which, which activates genes, interferon regulatory genes, and this, another set of genes, which are uh, the NF kappa B set of genes within the nucleus. And the activation of these genes results in production of interferons, the type one interferons, which are the alpha and beta interferons. And in the later phase of infection, there are type three interferons, which are called the interferon lambdas. The production of these interferons, I think, is the most critical step limiting the viral infection, especially in case of SARS-CoV-2 infections. Once these interferons are produced, please note these interferons are being produced by the cell which is infected with viruses. In most of the cases, this cell is a respiratory epithelial cell which is producing these interferons. These interferons are secreted out and they combine with the receptors present on the surrounding cell, surface of surrounding cells. They combine with these receptors and these interferons then activate the downstream pathways of JAK-STAT and these JAK-STAT pathways would lead to again activation of interferon regulatory genes and nf kappa uh, B set of genes which were activated here. So the healthy cells also have these activation of genes and they start to produce interferon. And this is extremely important because we have lots of interferon being produced. This is a good immune response. Uh, the interferons being produced by the uh, virus infected cell also interact with the receptors uh, present on the surface of uh, infected cell as well. So these interferons being produced act in an autocrine manner as well as paracrine manner. So they produce uh, a state of antiviral or resistance to virus infection within these cells. So the virus infected cell and the surrounding healthy cells both develop these proteins, they secrete these proteins which uh, produce, uh, which which cause a resistance to viral multiplication and its release. Just uh, in this cartoon, we have cell membrane here, endosome here, just uh, showing you the TLRs, virus gains entry through ACE2 receptors. In endosome, TLR3 and TLR9, they combine with viral components and the virus uh, TLR complex enters the cytoplasm, activates the two set of genes. Once the two set of genes are activated in the nucleus, this is nucleus, so interferon regulatory factors, and then we have NF kappa B set of genes. So the interferon regulatory factors, these genes produce interferons. Uh, sorry, uh, these are the type 1 interferons, and uh, we have the type 3 interferons also being produced later on. The type 1 interferons are alpha and beta, and type 3 interferons are lambda interferons. The type 1 interferons uh, produce uh, immune activation also, uh, but uh, uh, the type 3 interferons are more uh, into producing a state of resistance to viral infections. So the interferons produced by virus infected cells produce the antiviral state in the infected cells and surrounding cells. At the same time, the other set of genes which was activated produces cytokines and these cytokines are human necrosis factor, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, uh, monocyte hematactic factor, interleukin-8. And these set of cytokines activate uh, uh, phagocytes, which are present in the surrounding microenvironment uh, in the form of macrophages and neutrophils. Uh, these, uh, while the other set of cytokines are mainly concerned with recruiting uh, the inflammatory cells from the circulation to the site of infection, 
So the MCT would recruit monocytes, so it highlight it mainly recruiting neutrophils. So these and inflammatory infiltrate uh, moves to the site of infection, and these cytokines also result in increased expression of adhesion molecules on the surface of endothelial cells. At the same time, the macrophages which are involved in uh, uh, phagocytosis and antigen presentation start to express post-stimulatory molecules for the T lymphocytes. So with the infiltrate coming in, these cytokines promote acute inflammation. They also promote uh, the other mechanisms at the innate immune system. Uh, they promote phagocytosis. They also promote activation of the NK cells. And in the somewhat later stage, the macrophages present the antigens to T helper lymphocytes and initiate the activation of the specific immune response. So going back to interferons, how do they produce antiviral state? What they do is uh, uh, they, they inhibit the viral protein synthesis in the cytoplasm of the infected cell. They de degrade the viral RNA which is present in the cytoplasm and they would inhibit the assembly of uh, uh, RNA and proteins to produce a fresh viral. They stop and resist the multiplication of the virus in the cytoplasm of the infected cell. So this is happening in the respiratory epithelial cells. Most of the times the interferons being produced are causing antiviral state in the virus infected cell and in the surrounding cells as well. At the same time, the type 1 interferons and type 3 interferons are acting on NK cells, natural killer cells, part of the innate immune mechanism uh, to act, be activated and kill the virus infected cell. Now, NK cells recognize the virus infected cells as the virus infected cells have surface expression of stress molecules or damage associated molecular patterns. They have damps on their surface. They look ill. Their surface is ill. At the same time, virus to save itself down regulates expression of HLA class 1 on the surface of cells. Now, this down regulation, natural killers are natural born killers, they would kill any cell, host cell or otherwise, but all host cells have HLA class 1 on, the, on their surface, which switches off killing ability of NK cell. But as soon as virus turns off, decreases expression of HLA class 1 on the infected cell, NK cells recognize it as the infected cell and it goes to it and kills it by its uh, mediators, which are mostly membrane destroying chemicals, proteins. So type 1 interferon, type 3 interferon, and here we can see that once the T helper cells are activated after antigen presentation to them by macrophages, T helper cells start to produce type 2 interferon, which are interferon gamma. They also activate NK cells. So NK cells, natural killer cells being activated by type 1, type 2, and type 3 interferons in the later phases of immune response. So going back, just to... Uh, have a comparison of a good immune response, the critical component of the timely and adequate production of interferons is so important that as soon as the coronavirus interacts with ACE2 viruses in case of respiratory epithelial cell and with this protease, this complex is taken in in the endosome and as TLR viral component interaction takes place, these pathways are activated. Uh, interferons are produced and cytokines are produced. These interferons and cytokines produce the antiviral state here in the infected cell and the surrounding cell. And the, the production of these interferons and cytokines is so important in limiting the number of viruses. Now, if this interferon producing response is delayed or not adequate, not enough, then the viruses are able to infect a large number of cells, not the few cells here where few viruses are then available to reinfect. But here in this area, when uh, where the interferon response and cytokine response is not timely and not enough, then there are too many viruses and they would infect a large number of cells. A large number of epithelial cells would be infected. And uh, uh, these epithelial cells would start to produce their cytokines and interferon, bringing in a lot of inflammatory infiltrate. Now in this environment, there are a lot of pathogens and a lot of cytokines. The damage to respiratory epithelial cells would be mediated by one, 
the cytopathic effect. But the more important one is lots of cytokines, inflammatory cytokines producing lots of activity of cells, uh, chaotic activity. Here the activity was targeted and it was controlling the number of viruses. But here the activity is chaotic, disorganized immune response. Lots of cytokines, lots of stimulation. And uh, cells like neutrophils, they may be stimulated to an extent that they, uh, they spit out, they throw out their reactive oxygen radicals and enzymes. And this uh, process is called netosis, and this would uh, directly damage the respiratory epithelial cells. So the cells are being damaged by virus, and then the cells are also being damaged by this uh, inflammatory response uh, 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 of the cells, the activated cells throwing out their secretions. Large number of viruses, large number of cells infected. So this is a severe, this is an environment for severe disease, and this would be a limited disease. So the critical component uh, of innate immune response is timely production of type 1 and type 3 interferons and proper activation of NK cells, phagocytosis and antigen presentation. And macrophages is extremely important to initiate a specific or adaptive immune response. Now the virus for its infection wants to be successful, wants to increase its numbers, so it, it it, it realizes the importance of uh, the production of interferons. So its presence, just mere presence of its proteins and its genome in the cytoplasm would inhibit the pathways which lead to production of interferons and cytokines. So on the part of pathogen, it, the mere presence of its components in, in large numbers would inhibit the adequate immune response. So pathogen versus host uh, interaction in the initial phase of the immune response after virus entry, the timely production of interferon appears to be the most critical response. In viral vision strategies, if this response is not enough, there would be large number of viruses uh, infecting large number of cells. So in case of adequate immune response, on the left side of slide, we have timely production of interferons and limited number of viruses. Inadequate immune response, lots of viruses and lots of cytokines. And this inadequate response may be in the form of delay or insufficient quantity. <coughs> now, once there is excessive stimulation, that affects the epithelial cells as well as the endothelial cells as well. Where there is increased expression of procoagulant factors, it would uh, promote platelet aggregation and lead to, uh, in the end, to the IC. Now the activation of specific immune response, this would be initiated after phagocytosis, the viral debris by macrophages. And they would present the antigen to T helper lymphocytes in combination with HLA class 2 antigen. And once the antigen is presented to T helper lymphocytes, they would start to produce their own cytokines. And these cytokines may be in the form of interleukin 2, interferon gamma, or TNF alpha. And this is the cytokine profile. This is the cytokine profile which would lead to the specific targeted immune response and more in terms of cellular immune response. While after stimulation, the T helper cells may start to produce interleukin 4, 5, 6, 10, and 13. And this cytokine profile would ensure more of antibody production, the antibody production by the B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes see the antigen on their own, but to produce antibodies and to have antibody class switch, producing antibodies uh, 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 in sufficient levels, the B lymphocytes, after their st initial stimulation, they require helper T cells help in the form of these cytokines. If these cytokines are there, 
they would tend to stimulate a large number of B lymphocytes. If you have a large number of B lymphocytes, these B lymphocytes differs from one another. They would produce antibody directed against the virus, but the, the target antigen may be a little different. So what we are looking for in terms of specific antibodies are the antibodies which are targeted against spike protein and can neutralize the virus, can prevent the infection, can prevent the interaction of spike proteins with the ACE2 receptors on the surface of target cell. So with this kind of stimulation, there would be less, comparatively less number of molecules which would be neutralizing and with so many B cells being stimulated, there will be lots and lots of antibody, but that may not be useful. And some of those antibodies may actually help uh, increasing the infection by way of combining with the virus. And then this virus antibody complex is taken in the target cells with the help of FC gamma receptors. Now the helper T cell help is also critical to activate the cytotoxic T lymphocytes which are meant to destroy the virus infected cells and the virus infected cells are recognized by the cytotoxic T lymphocytes as the infected cells display viral antigens in combination with HLA class 1 molecules on their surface and these are recognized by T cell receptors cytotoxic T lymphocytes. These cytotoxic T lymphocytes get stimulated after this recognition and with the Th1 kind of cytokines coming, coming from helper T cells, they get activated and they release their mediators which can destroy the target cell membrane. So the infected cell is destroyed and the home, the cell, the because viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, they live only inside the cell. So their home is destroyed and the viral infection is limited. So with a good targeted immune response, Yes, one kind of profile mostly we have specific antibodies coming from the lymphocytes neutralizing it, just limiting the infection. But in an environment where there is lots of viruses, overactivation, lots of epithelial cells being infected, lots of uh, cytokines and interferons, there would be inadequate. Uh, 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 the antibodies uh, may not all be neutralizing, there would be so many other antibodies which may actually increase infection. The uh, phagocytosing capacity of macrophages changes in an environment of lots of stimulation. So again, going back to the same slide where we can see that limited number of viruses, targeted immune response, and large number of viruses, large number of cells infected, and having uh, uh, a, a disa disastrous uh, consequence in the form of severe disease. Now, mostly viruses infect the respiratory epithelial cells, but these viruses may also infect the intestinal epithelial cells and where antibodies are produced uh, uh, in, in case of fear, uh, respiratory tract, mostly IgM and IgG. In case of uh, uh, intestinal uh, immune response, we have production of IgA antibodies. Now, for effective immune response against viruses, the critical component is production of interferons type 1 and type 3 followed by activation of NK cells and then generation of virus specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes. For antibodies, we require the neutralizing type of antibodies and appearance of these antibodies help in reduction of viruses and uh, consequently the infection of target cells. In case of SARS-CoV-2, we can see here the earliest antibody to be produced in green line around five to seven days is IgM type, it goes up and then comes down quickly as well by the third week. Uh, similarly for IgA antibodies which follow the production of IgM antibodies, and what we are looking for is the production of IgG antibodies. And if they are neutralizing in nature, you can see that if we are able to detect the viral genome, RNA genome or its proteins and quantitate it, then we find that with the IgM and IgA antibodies, there, there, there is a possibility that there, there is a still large amount of genome and proteins are present uh, in, uh, in this in respiratory samples or and the, the, this this just indicates that there may there is a uh, possibility that uh, viable virus is still present but as we have neutralizing antibodies coming in the uh, possibility of viable 
finding viable virus uh, in these clinical specimens goes down. So the immune response, uh, which is dysfunctional, leads to excessive infiltration of monocytes, macrophages, and T cells. Uh, there may be production of cytokine, which may result in systemic cytokine storm, and uh, uh, this much of respiratory damage, and increase in permeability, exudation of fluids, may result in ARDS, followed by pneumonia, and this wide, widespread inflammation will lead to multi-organ failure and in unfortunate patients, deaths. For successful viral infection, the virus wants inhibition of uh, interferon production. It wants inhibition of phagocytosis by macrophages and killing by natural killer cells. And this inhibition may be because of the large number of viruses in the infected cell or in the cell surroundings. This inhibition may also be caused by extreme age in the elderly, the immune response is not at its optimum. Uh, this inhibition may also be caused by immunosuppression because of drugs or certain uh, diseases like malignant diseases, or it may be uh, the immune exhaustion because of the infection. <coughs> Excuse me. So a high viral load is the one thing we want to avoid if you want to avoid the severe disease. So the high viral load would depend on the impaired immunity and successful immune evasion by SARS-CoV-2 viruses. And this uh, high viral load would result in overproduction of coagulant factor, hyperactivation of macrophages and monocytes will lead to uh, increased expression of adhesion molecules on endothelial, on endothelial cells and uh, extensive damage to the epithelial cells overproduction of cytokines leading to hyperinflammation. And the result, clinical result may be in the form of uh, DIC, uh, cytokine storm, HLH, or uh, ARDS and pneumonia, ultimately leading to multi-organ failure. Now, knowing the immunopathology, uh, one would like to limit the number of viruses causing the infection. And the, uh, the most important factors here which would which can limit the number of viruses. The treatment strategies would depend on the use of antiviral drugs and then use of specific neutralizing antibodies. The antibodies which can neutralize and prevent the interaction of the viruses with their target receptors that in this case, ACE2 receptors. The, uh, there is a possibility uh, the therapeutic strategy is being formulated where recombinant ACE2 receptors are being tried in animal models so that viruses may combine with these recombinant ACE2 receptors and may not be able to reach their target, uh, interact with ACE2 receptors on their target cells. Similarly, uh, um, about uh, immunopathology, we know that a lot of damage is, is caused by overproduction of cytokines. Then in this case, uh, monoclonal antibodies directed against uh, um, uh, cytokines of their receptors, Ocilizumab. In this case, uh, this monoclonal antibody is directed against IL-6 receptors and a Kindra, which is uh, anti-TNF uh, treatment. And then we ha may have Ceruleuzumab, which is uh, anti-IL-6 antibody. And we may have uh, the use of uh, inhibitors for the JAK-STAT, which lead to the production of uh, cytokines. And lately, we have the dexamethasone, which which uh, uh, which is there to inhibit the immune response in terms of production of cytokines. Not only that, it also inhibits the antigen processing and presentation by the antigen-presenting cells. So, vaccines, uh, depending uh, uh, now we know about the critical components of the immune response, there has been tremendous amount of work. Currently, there are more than 200 uh, vaccine candidates in development uh, with 17 of them. In only six months, 17 of them have uh, entered the phase one or phase two of clinical trials. Uh, but an effective vaccine would uh, require um, uh, at least um, six months to a year of follow-up and phase three trials. And uh, these are the safety and efficacy trials to be phase two trials. And it has to be followed by phase three trials. 
So the near future, we, are, uh, we may not be having any vaccine, uh, but later on, uh, obviously, the effective control of infection throughout the world is only possible once we have a vaccine which is able, which is safe and able to provide a long-lasting immunity. So to conclude, the, uh, an understanding of immune response to infection by SARS-CoV-2 is critical to the development of effective strategies to establish early diagnosis and its effective treatment. Development of safe and effective vaccine is based on identification of key elements of immune response for a long-lasting infection. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much, Dr. Tyrazis. A very enlightening talk of immune response to COVID-19. So our next speaker is Dr. Rubina Kazi. She is our molecular biologist and she is working with us for last almost 10 years now. And I must say that she has worked tirelessly during this pandemic and made this possible, made this possible that our molecular section is able to provide not only the services for the hospital, but for a whole country and also with highest quality standards possible. Dr. Amina Kazi, she will be talking about lab testing in coronavirus, myths and reality. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Rumina. Um, I'm the lab head of uh, molecular pathology in Shokat Khan Hospital. I've been working here for the past nine years, and uh, this uh, era of pandemic was very unusual for me, and as it is for all of you. So today, um, I have planned to talk about laboratory testing in coronavirus myths and reality. So let's see what coronavirus is the beast that has wreaked havoc globally is, um, it seems like this. Can I, do I have the, um, okay. So these are the spikes around the, uh, uh, the, the virus has, and because of these, they are known as a crown-like, and therefore the hence the name coronavirus. Initially, when it was identified at the end of 2019 in Wuhan, China, it was known as novel coronavirus 2019, but then the name is changed to severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 because there are other human-like coronaviruses, uh, human uh, coronaviruses, there are SARS, cov one and MERS. Now, the illness or the disease that is caused by SARS, cov 2 is named as coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, as popularly known as. So if you look at the structure of SARS-CoV-2 virion, it is important to know that there are these uh, spike proteins very much talked about because it is the spike protein that is the virus uses to enter the human cells. Then there is heme agglutinin esterase. The function of this is not very well known. The membrane protein is responsible for the membrane of the virus. The nucleocapsid N region is a structural protein and it is important for packaging of the viral RNA into helical nucleocapsid. And this is the envelope protein that surrounds the, um, the and that encodes the enveloping protein encapsulating the virus and it also has the embedded these spikes. Now, to go into a little bit more detail, we will see that the, these spike proteins, they are of two kinds, S1 and S2. I won't go into the detail as the previous um, colleague of mine, 
he has talked about this. So, but I'll just touch upon that there are two uh, subunits of spike proteins, S1 and S2. S1 protein, it helps into the entry because the virus, it fuses, it uh, binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2 receptor. And once it is, it is bound to this receptor, the S2 unit helps in the fusion of the viral and viral and cellular membranes. So S1 helps for the for binding and S2 helps for the entry of the virus. The as I mentioned that this is the um, the uh, coronavirus is a positive sense strand single stranded RNA. It is approximately 30 kilobases in length. The nucleocapsid protein. This is the nucleocapsid as I said it, it is important because it functions as RNA chaperone and facilitates RNA synthesis. Then this is very important to know that envelope, this envelope protein, this envelope is a bilipid, uh, is a lipid bilayer and it is derived from host cell. And that is how it, it can avoid the host immune system or, or and it contains E proteins, which are very critical aspects of the viral life cycle. Then the membrane protein that is required for budding of the virus. So we, we, we wanted to know that we have, uh, we know that what's the mode of transmission and how it tra started the transmission of SARS-CoV-1 and 2 uh, initially in Wuhan, China in 2019. So we know the transmission was from mammals as biological carriers to human. So you can see the bat, uh, the uh, Pangolin was involved. People they say the author. Some papers they mentioned that the uh, through the genomic um, data that pangolins are involved. Some papers the jury is out there. Some some says pangolin is the intermediate host. Some are saying that it is not the intermediate host, but they can directly um, trans, uh, transmit the virus. And then later in March, WHO also said that there is transmission from human to human, and hence the. Uh, social distancing and hygiene, hand hygiene, and all these uh, matters that we need to take to uh, to avoid transmission of coronavirus too. So once, uh, because we are talking about coronavirus and we are talk, we will be talking about detection. So it is important to talk about the sample types. Then what are the sample types that we can have to detect uh, SARS-CoV-2? The most uh, uh, talked about or the most uh, common sample type is nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal samples. Um, bro uh, bronco, alveolar, lavage or tracheal aspirate, etc., sputum, these samples are very occasional. So most these samples they are taking, taken through uh, nasopharyngeal swabs are taken and then they are transported to the labs in uh, VTM, which is a viral transport medium. Now it is important that in initially um, there was <clears throat> there was a lack of uh, these uh, availability of these uh, uh, viral transport medium and swabs in the market. So there were different types of uh, swabs and viral transport medium. So it is very important to validate all these different swabs that we use and the VTMs that we use because with different extraction kits. So be because in my experience, two of the uh, viral transport mediums with one of the extraction kit did not work at all. So it is important to validate them before we start using them in a routine clinical lab. And it is also important to make sure that the swab, swab that we use are flop swabs because the sample, we can take more samples and also it does not inhibit PCR um, reactions. The other uh, swabs, they might have a calcium um, uh, Aglinate some, some chemicals on that that may inhibit PCR. Therefore, we have to uh, be aware of those kind of swabs that are available that are present but should not be used in PCR. So uh, sometimes uh, people they send nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal samples. Both swabs are taken and put in the same uh, transport medium, and this is only to increase the viral load. So the uh, Nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal samples are talked about, but the only sample that is not talk, talked about is saliva. So recently, few papers have shown that the sensitivity of uh, PCR from saliva samples is much more than nasopharyngeal samples. So papers have shown that nasopharyngeal samples, they have 
PCR from mesopharyngeal samples have more sense, higher sensitivity as compared to oropharyngeal samples. But uh, papers, recent papers have shown that saliva has even more sensitivity in RT-PCR than nasopharyngeal swabs. And the research is still ongoing. So this is uh, the type of uh, swab and viral transport medium and it is very important to be cognizant of the fact that when you transport they, they have to be transported in a double uh, bags. So what are the laboratory based molecular diagnostics? They have become the hallmark for COVID-19 diagnostics these days. Uh, although there are different types of diagnostics available, for example, this uh, clinical uh, clinical diagnostics because uh, if the patient is uh, really sick or very unwell or serious, then of course the X-rays and CTs are used for that. But clinical diagnostics is not the first line of diagnostic. It's the molecular diagnostic. That's the first line of diagnostics because you have to first find out whether uh, the patient has COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2 virus or not. So there are different kinds of molecular diagnostics available. Although sequencing is available, whole genome sequencing, but primarily it is used in earlier in the days of outbreak for initial identification of the novel virus. But it is not, uh, so it is a tool of discovery. It is not used uh, as a routine uh, uh, diagnostic test in clinical labs. So RT-PCR actually is the cornerstone for, uh, for identifying uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. So you can use these words interchangeably. So in digital diagnostics, yes, in the <clears throat> emerging era of uh, machine learning, digital diagnostics has come up as a new innovation in the medical field as a complementary tool for standard screening and diagnostic tests. So current, this current infection with uh, or outbreak of COVID-19 has provided another opportunity actually for the artificial intelligence applications to prove its worth. And there are now these different applications used elsewhere um, uh, for diagnosis of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. So there are uh, this immune assays. We'll talk about this a little bit. We'll touch upon this later on, but just to mention here that there are different kinds of amino assays available. The antibody testing, the antigen testing, and ELISA-based, which is, I think, the most, most, sens most sensitive one because it gives you the value. At least you know the quantity of, although it's a qualitative test, but you can identify how much uh, antibodies do you have. The antigen testing is, uh, <clears throat> is another uh, way of uh, um, detecting the virus because you can take the nasopharyngeal swab and take the sample from that, put it on the slide where the antibodies are al already adhered to, and you incubate that. But the the form of this is that it has to, you have to have millions of viral sample viral load in the sample to be able to um, run this test. So the, and the sensitivity is low. So antibody testing is uh, also um, time dependent and also the sensitivity is different. The, there are like uh, lateral flow uh, immune assays and ELISAs and point of care testing, but the sensitivity of these tests are low. Therefore, the first line of detection is molecular, which is RT-PCR. So let's see um, just a recap of what RT-PCR is. We have to um, because RT-PCR is a very um, is a special molecular diagnostic is a specialized field where it's a, a, a very trained technologists. They need to run these assays and most importantly, the uh, people interpreting the results should be very, very trained, especially if uh, they are interpreting the manual assays. So RT-PCR is reverse transcript, uh, transcription polymerase chain reaction. So I'll just use the, uh, the acronym RT-PCR. So there are two kinds of RT-PCRs that, uh, that are being used all over the world in, in Pakistan also. One is manual system and the other is automation. In manual, what they do is they, there are two steps in manual. You take the sample, the sample comes to the lab. You take the sample, extract RNA because we, as we said that this is a RNA virus, so we extract the RNA and then 
that is a separate process. So extraction of RNA is a separate process. And then there is this step of reverse transcription. So reverse transcription, because this is single stranded mRNA in the presence of oligonucleotides and reverse transcriptase enzyme, complementary cDNA is made. So when this DNA double stranded um, molecule is made, this DNA, then this is amplified in a PCR. So PCR means it amplifies. For example, if you want to have 10 copies of your CNIC card, you put it on the you know, Xerox machine or the photocopier and you put 10 copies and you get 10 copies. So similarly, in these thermal cyclers, when we, uh, we amplify these uh, uh, empty cons by using primers. So primers are specific to these specific areas. So let us see what are the primers or uh, the relative positions of the amplicons that are used in SARS-CoV-2. So this is the genome of SARS-CoV-2. Here you can see this is um, open reading frame 1A, open reading frame 1B. This is the spike protein, the envelope protein or E protein, the membrane and the nucleocapsid. So there is a reason why I'm mentioning all this because by, when we do PCR, we have different targets. So you can see that the relative positions of these amplicon targets here are from this to this area. So this we can have primers here and amplify this area of ORF1A or this area of E gene or this area of N gene. So these numbers here, they show the genome positions according to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 gene bank and uh, gene bank, the, nucle the nucleotides in the gene bank. And ORF1 actually what it quotes for, it quotes for replicase complex and it is integral in viral replication. So we need to keep these different targets. So these are different genes that are available for PCR in different kits. So I will talk about the kits also that which kits are using what. In automation, so this was mostly like in manual, we have is extraction, separate extraction, then reverse transcription and then PCR or RT-PCR in one step also. In automation, what we do is we take the sample, we don't do any manual, uh, 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 any manual steps in there. We take the sample, put it in the machine along with the positive and negative control that has to be there with every run. Otherwise, we do not consider that a valid run. So we take them and put them in the machine and after three and a half hours to four hours, the results are shown and displayed on the computer. So then we go and we manually, although the automation, it gives you the result in positive and negative because it's a qualitative test. It doesn't give you the viral load, like the number of viral particles per mil, but it gives you just the qualitative answer that yes, the person sample has a coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV-2 or not. <clears throat> So if we go to SARS-CoV-2 genome, even a little boat zoom in the genome, so we'll see that it's a 30 kilo base genome. It's quite a huge uh, genome actually. And it has all these uh, different, uh, uh, these um, uh, open reading frames, 1A, 1B. And if you go back to this one, you can see that this open reading frame, 1A and 1B, it has all these small open reading frames together jumped up in this one. So the target here, sorry, the target here, here I will show you later on is mostly they take uh, RDRP, which is the um, 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 RDRP gene, yes, for PCR as a target. So this you can see here, the open reading frame, these are different amino acids for these different subunits of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. So it's important to talk about this because RT-PCR is based on uh, these genome structure and the primers are made against all these different regions. Therefore, we need to know what are the target genes that are available and why we are taking those target genes for detecting the SARS-CoV-2 genome in patient samples. So this is, I've taken this from a paper where they have uh, overview of kits for RT-PCR based detection of SARS-CoV-2. <coughs> And here you can see that there are different manufacturers, like there are these different manufacturers, Altoona Diagnostic, they're from different countries, and this is their catalog numbers, this is their storage conditions, mostly at minus 20 degree, 
and regulatory status is mostly CIBD, which is the European um, Commission uh, approval. And these are the target genes. So you can see that this company, this test has E gene and S gene. So if we run the samples and we have E gene and S gene, two targets. But here in this kit, they have ORF1 AB. So now with the, the structure of genome that I showed you, you will have in your memory that where this ORF1 1 A and 1 B is. This, um, this primer design, which we also use in our lab, has RDRP, RNA is dependent RNA polymerase. This is also a part of ORF 1A, 1B. And this company is used only E gene. So coming back to now, this C gene, which we also used uh, for, um, for validations only, um, this has three genes. So you can say, see that different um, companies, they have different targets. These are two targets, one target, these are two, but this company C gene from Korea, it has three targets, RDRP, N gene, and E gene. So you can see that these, the E gene mostly is actually, uh, it is a, a pan gene that is present in all other coronaviruses also. For example, SARS-CoV-1, MERS virus, which is the Middle Eastern coronavirus, all these viruses, in addition to SARS-CoV-2, they have E gene. So E gene is a pan gene. So initially, actually, you know, it is a new virus, and every day a new thing, new research is going on, and new things are unfolding, new information is unfolding. So E gene initially was used as a screening gene. So people would be used for E gene with E gene PCR for screening. If they were positive for E gene, then they were used. They were these S gene or ORF1 or RDRP or N gene and RDRP, these were used for confirmation because they, these all genes are specific to um, SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> so this paper uh, further analyzed these samples here and they have shown here that they used, with, uh, they, used they showed the CT values. So they used 13 samples and run RT-PCR with all these different kits. And you can see this is this is the line where they show that beyond 42, like this is a um, um, imaginary number they have put here for any, any um, product beyond this 42 is negative. So anything below 40 CT values is positive. So they have run 13 samples with each of these kits and you can see that here only 10 samples were um, detected, whereas three samples were not detected. So here the sensitivity was 12 samples. So you can see with E gene only 10 samples were detected, with and with S gene, with E and S gene, sorry, only 10 samples were detected, with BGI ORF1, this is the target, 12 samples. Similarly, with the primer design, 10 samples were detected, and C gene, 12 samples. So the sensitivity of all these um, 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 kits are different. So you can see none of them except for this R biofirm, which has which could detect all 13 out of 13, but because it was using only E gene. So I'm not sure if really we can say the sensitivity of this, this kit is higher than the others, but the, all other kits could not identify 13 out of 13. So they could either do 10 or 11 um, um, samples out of a total of 13 samples. In the um, graph B, the clinical samples here, only highest concentration samples, they were used here. You can see this is the average the median, median CT value for all these samples. Here you can see this is the, the, the triangle here shows the sample with the low viral load. I, I shouldn't be using viral load here because CTs cannot be used for viral load. But anyway, the sample burden is low here, whereas the sample burden is high and hence the high um, um, CT value. So, so this the the idea behind showing all this is uh, for the labs that they are doing in-house assays. They need to really validate all the kits that they use, especially if it is a manual, like these are all manual kits where you have to do extraction separately. So you have to validate the extraction kit first, then you have to validate the PCR kits. And for validation, you have to really do the 
efficiency of PCR by diluting by dilutions of the samples, by uh, to check the specificity of the um, of the kit, by, to check the uh, sensitivity of the kit. And once you do all these uh, validations, only then you can use these tests in clinical diagnostic lab. It's very very important. So here they they also try to uh, use the lowest limit of detection, uh, which is a very tricky. Uh, um, you know, experiment to do, but here, so in X axis, there is the RNA input here and in Y axis, you can see that they show positive results in all parallel reactions. So here they have shown the E gene assay where the sensitivity of the test is 3.9 copies per reaction. It's pretty sensitive E gene assay, for, whereas for the RDRP assay, the sensitivity lowest detection limit, that means if you have 3.9 copies of virus per reaction, then that can be detected. So it's really sensitive. And for the RDRP assay, the sensitivity is the the detection limit is 3.6 um, uh, copies per reaction. And this is the range of 95% uh, um, uh, confidence interval is 2.7 to 11.2, whereas the for e gene it is more sensitive because it's the level, the range is 2.8 to 9.8. Uh, so the range here is lower than the RDRP gene. So the sensitivity, the sorry, the lowest limit of detection for E gene is better than the RDRP. But these kind of lower limit of detections one has to do with all the uh, different kits in the lab. Unfortunately, uh, because it was pandemic and uh, FDA, the in, in America, they have given, or the CDC in, in China or other um, regulatory bodies, they have given emergency use authorization to different um, companies that they have made these tests. And these companies really did not validate these kits as, um, as they used to do with the previous kits that they launched because it takes a lot of time and they use about thousands of samples for validation. But in these, for example, uh, kits, the manual and uh, automation, they they are still validating their as we go and as they are seeing the problems and getting the feedback from the uh, um, end users and they're improving their tests now. So the sensitivity, specificity and lowest limit of detection is becoming better and better as we go on, as we go on into the pandemic. So the estimated limit of detection for SARS-CoV-2 in copies per mil for individual assays that they detected was really good. The lowest was 3.8 for E gene, uh, and the highest was 18, um, 23 um, genes for primer design. So the sensitivity of the lowest limit of detection of primer design was different as compared to Altona or C gene or all these different assays. So therefore, we when we therefore we say that we cannot compare. Uh, the results or reports of two different labs because different labs they use different kits and their results, their their sensitivity, specificity, their lowest limit of detection, all they are different. So you really one cannot compare the results from one lab to another. So it's always good to keep going back to the same lab so that you know the difference. So there was a uh, comparison of uh, another paper I saw uh, and I liked it because they, they have comparisons of SARS-CoV-2 detection from nasopharyngeal uh, samples by the Roche COVAS 6800 test with their laboratory developed test. So the reason why I was interested because we also use a Roche COVAS 6800 uh, uh, machine which is fully automation as uh, with uh, a few of the other labs in Pakistan are using this and this this is the system uh, the 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 advantage of using this system is that you don't have to do manual uh, anything manual. You just take the sample, and you, so the it is more uh, robust. I can say uh, for reports and results. Here you can see that they showed the overall percent agreement is about 95 95.8 percent and 94 percent positive percent overall percent. So that means the COBOS is as the lab developed test was as good as the robot. robot. So this is the most important slide for interpretation of the tests. Uh, I hope you can see that uh, I've taken this from a paper. Um, 
So the viral testing interpretation is that if it is positive, the PCR is positive, then that means most likely a person is a, an active COVID infection, has active COVID-19 infection and can give the virus to others. So that means it is infective. That person is infective also. So what, what should that person do? Stay home and follow CDC guidelines or the local guidelines so that they do not transmit the uh, virus. If the person is PCR negative, then most likely you do not currently have an active COVID-19 infection and most likely because the timing of uh, sampling is also important. If the timing of sampling is late into the infection, then it may be an, a false negative also. So, so even then, if you are negative, but if you have symptoms, you should keep monitoring symptoms and stay home and if and maybe retest it again later on. So antibody testing, I didn't talk about antibody, a little bit touched upon the definition, but antibody testing is, uh, although um, it's uh, only used for uh, zero prevalence in this, in the, and also it can tell you if the person is has been exposed or had uh, infection and resolved it. So the if the person has antibody positive, then that means that you likely have had a COVID-19 infection. So you may be protected. Up now, there are many questions people ask whether if we have antibodies, whether we are protected or not. Nobody knows yet because uh, it's a new virus and still research is going on. It may give you immunity, but it may not be. So you still have to take care of yourself as you had no antibodies. So if you are negative, then that means likely thing you never had COVID-19 infection, but you still have to take a step to protect yourself. So if you have both, like antibody and viral testing both, because nowadays people are uh, leaning towards antibody testing, which is, uh, um, I don't know if that's the right test to do for diagnostics, because it's only PCR test for diagnostics, but for uh, uh, resolve infection, one can do antibody, and especially now that the plasma, uh, people are donating plasmas, for that you can do antibody testing, but that has to be ELISA-based, not the uh, lateral flow-based assays. The POC testing is not, um, not a good one. So if the viral load of the RT-PCR is positive, antibody is uh, um, positive also, that means you had you have the active COVID-19 infection and can give virus to other. That means you are still infected, even though you have antibody, but you are infected. So you have to take all the precautionary measures. But if the viral PCR is positive, but antibody is negative, and it happens, we have done that here, and there are many, um, many people that they are PCR positive, and when they come back, even after 30 days, they do not uh, manifest any antibodies. So it happens, it varies from person to person because of the difference in the immunity of the uh, people. So if viral uh, PCR is negative, antibody positive, of course, we know that the person have had and recovered from a COVID-19 infection. So it, the, the, what you have to do is you may be protected from reinfection, although um, I have seen uh, three cases of, uh, I, should, I don't know if we should use reinfection because there is a lot of debate going on, whether it's reinfection, whether the virus was hiding somewhere and you know reactivated, whether it is reinfection with a new virus, nobody knows that. It's still uh, the jury is out there and a lot of research needs to be done to answer this question. Viral, if RT-PCR is negative and antibody is negative, that means you likely never had a COVID-19 infection. So these are different, um, uh, you know, um, scenarios where the interpretation of the uh, reports or results are done. So the, this is just a slight, um, quick uh, slide to show you that the um, I said the, uh, the PCR can be false uh, negative or um, if you take the sample somewhere at, in, after the 14, up between 7 and 14 days because the maximum infectivity and the best viral load is between 0 to 7 days. So this is just to show you that, uh, you know, to, um, um, uh, to, to, for example, um, for the tests to enable a clinical decision. So, so clinical decision B is based on the test. So when should we do a testing? is very important because the one type of test for zero prevalence uh, or surveillance is different than for diagnose, uh, diagnostics, for screening symptomatic patient, for treating initial treat, treatment initiation decision, etc, etc. So all these uh, areas, the bars over green and this gray, this 
this these type of patients or samples should be tested with NAT, like the PCR testing, and for surveillance, of course, the antibody testing is recommended. You can one can use antibody testing. The key summary points here, the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrate the essential role of diagnosis in the control of communicable diseases. This is a communicable disease. Laboratory-based molecular assays for detecting SARS-CoV-2 in respiratory of current reference standard and early massive deployment of SARS diagnostic for case finding help curb the epidemic in several countries like Japan and Korea and also Singapore. And urgent clinical and public health needs now drive an unprecedented global effort to increase testing capacity and uh, Alhamdulillah in Pakistan, I can see that the testing capacity has increased in many labs, which is a very good thing. Now I'll just touch upon the last slide, which I've written myths and reality. Actually, it's frequently asked questions that we get every day uh, in the lab. So we pick up the phone and we get a question from the patients. Um, and they say that, can I be PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2 after 15 days of isolation? Well, yes and no. Yes, because uh, one can, the maximum uh, days that uh, one is in. So, so people are now seeing PCR positivity is different from an infectivity because a person can be PCR positive after 30 days of uh, infection. But that doesn't mean that that, uh, that the, uh, person is infected. And this has come from research again, that uh, research from Korea and other uh, two papers have come up also, that they took samples from patients after eight, 10 and 15 days of uh, infection, and they could not grow the virus. They isolated the virus and they tried to grow that in culture. They could not grow the virus. That means the virus was not alive, viable. So if the virus is not viable, that means the person is not infected. And therefore, now the uh, the uh, policy in many hospitals and many places have changed. Before, initially, when the, somebody was SARS-CoV-2 positive, the person had to be um, isolated for 14 days and then retested twice in uh, for 24 hours uh, time period uh, between 24 hours. And if two PCRs were negative, they were allowed to come back to work. But now it is changed and now people can stay for 10 days in isolation. Symptomatic patients can stay 10 days in isolation and three, plus three days if they have mild symptoms, whereas asymptomatic patients can come back uh, after 10 days if they have no symptoms at all. So this has come back because of the, uh, the basic sciences, that is the cultural, uh, cultural ex experiments from viruses, which showed that viruses are not viable after um, eight to 10 days. Uh, then there was some people, they asked why I'm PCR positive after 30 days. I, I'm tired of isolation and I've just answered that question. Some said I was positive on July 1st and negative on July 5th. How is it possible? It is possible because sometimes the viral load is quite low. So you can be just a borderline positive. And if you, uh, five days is a lot of time for a healthy, especially for asymptomatic person, if you are healthy, you can clear the virus. So it is possible that if you are, um, uh, you know, PCR positive uh, day one and after five days you become PCR negative. It's nothing to worry about. You can clear the virus and it is possible because the viral load may be low or there are other reasons also. Maybe the sample uh, was taken and the viral, viral load did not come up. The concentration of virus was less. And uh, with many other, but the last one is I have negative PCR report from some X lab and how can it be positive again in this lab? So this is uh, many queries that come to us that people, uh, they go to one lab, they do their PCR, their PCR is negative, then they send, I don't know why they are not satisfied with that report and they come back to us. And they then the result is uh, when the when we give out the report positive, then they complain that why it's possible. So I have explained all these reasons to, in the previous slides that different kits are used, different machines are used, different... Uh, I mean, there are so many variables. You cannot really compare results from one lab to another. And especially when you are comparing manual, uh, you know, reports to automation, then that is a big no-no. Because, you know, in manual, different genes are, uh, different target genes are used. And so 
you know, the sensitivities are different, the lowest detection limits are different, and there are so many variables that you cannot complain about, or you cannot be worried, and you cannot compare the two labs' results. So, therefore, I always suggest to stick to one lab. If you gave sample to one lab and did that, you go back to that lab so that you know what the um, um, answer is. So, this is uh, uh, what my experience is uh, with the different uh, patients when they call the lab, and I thought I should share, and maybe if somebody is listening, uh, will and have uh, gotten the answer to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Dr. Ramina, <clears throat> so this frequently asked section, uh, frequently asked question and answer session must be very helpful because must have uh, solved many queries uh, in your minds. So the last speaker is Dr. Bushra Hassan. She is a clinical hematologist. She is working with us for the last two years, and she is fellow of Royal College of College of Pathology in clinical hematology, and also has done fellowship in uh, disorders of RBCs, rendered cells. And I think she's most suitable person to talk about this update in convalescent plasma therapy and COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Misha, thank you. Dr. Bushra Edison. I'm one of the hematology consultants in the Shop of Amman Memorial Cancer Hospital in Lahore. I will be uh, talking today about update in convalescent plasma therapy. Uh, as my speak previous speakers have mentioned about the COVID-19 infection, all of us know that uh, COVID-19 infection, which is caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, was declared a pandemic in March this year. And although there are similarities um, with the historic uh, coronavirus epidemics like um, SARS-1 and MERS, uh, with that were responsible for 813 and 858 deaths previously, but the scale of impact that COVID-19 infection has had in the healthcare facilities is much more um, uh, phenomenal because it was an unprecedented challenge. So if you have a quick flashback and all the pandemics and the lessons that we have learned from them, that can help give us some uh, insight into the management as far as plasma therapy is concerned. Uh, the pandemics have been um, around for decades and years and nobody can uh, forget the Black Death that has swiped practically half of the European population. Uh, the lesson learned from that was the nature of the zoonosis, how the animals help in spread of the infections. Then there was H1N1 Spanish flu, the mortality of which was 2.5 percent, and uh, the the more the more um, uh, relevant of the pandemics uh, to the COVID-19 infections is the SARS-CoV-1 virus infection that was in 2002 to 2004. The mortality of that was 9.6 percent, but it was uh, um, short-lived. MERS COVID virus that caused the camel flu in the Mediterranean region in uh, 2012, it was uh, quite short-lived, but the mortality was very high at 34.3%. Uh, H1N1 swine flu, which stuck in 2009 to 2010, the mortality was low at 0.02%, but the lesson learned was that once you have a vaccine for such a um, viral infection, the droplet infection, uh, then you can control the pandemic. Currently, we are facing the SARS-CoV-2 virus infection called COVID-19 that um, uh, has uh, affected uh, almost or in fact every country of the world and the mortality rate is between 1.38 to 3.4 percent with an average of 2.5 percent. So the lessons based on the previous uh, epidemics and pandemics is something that is helping us in uh, modifying our, our treatment now. 
However, we do not have any evidence of the management uh, and what we are saying today might not be true tomorrow. Keeping this in mind, let's talk about the convalescent plasma therapy. What is convalescent plasma? Uh, this is the plasma that is uh, recovered from the patients who had the COVID-19 infection. This plasma can be given to the patients who are suffering from the disease. It is a passive antibody therapy. Uh, it is not something new. Uh, this has been around for centuries. It has been used in the past for diphtheria, pneumococcal pneumonia, hepatitis A, B, mumps, polio, measles, rabies. And uh, this was shown to be effective to some extent, uh, even an Ebola infection. Uh, the preliminary China um, Chinese data that came from Wuhan, uh, that had, it, it had no control arm, so the results suggested that it might be helpful. Um, it has been used in MERS and uh, SARS-CoV-1 infection, and the results for those were not incre incredibly good. So based on this, we will see what are the updates on it at present. So does it work? Uh, we do not know for sure is the simple answer. Uh, the systemic review that of the convalescent plasma therapy that was used in influenza and SARS did benefit, it shows some clinical benefit, but this cannot be entirely um, extrapolated into the cars, uh, current uh, pandemic. There's conflicting evidence about the effect of uh, convalescent plasma or even hyperimmune immunoglobulins for treating severe acute respiratory infection. Studies uh, that were done for influenza were also contradictory with some randomized control trials showing effectiveness, whereas others were showing no benefit. The references are attached. So the next question, is this um, treatment safe or not? Again, there's limited information available about the specific adverse events uh, which are related to the convalescent plasma therapy, but symptoms that have been reported are similar to any of the reactions that uh, patients can have from plasma blood components, including fevers, chills, allergic reactions, and transfusion related acute lung injury. And this has been reported from the um, uh, the case reports uh, as in the reference. Then the transfer of the coagulation factors present in the plasma products is potentially harmful for patients with COVID-19 who are already at an increased risk of thromboembolic events and there are more and more studies um, uh, coming forth uh, explaining the thromboembolic nature of the disease. Uh, in addition to these adverse events, transfusion transmitted infections, red cell aluminizations, hemolytic transfusion reactions have also been described following the plasma transfusion. Now, pathogen inactivation can be implemented to decrease the risk of these transmitting infections, but this is not being widely practiced, so the um, infection rate will only uh, come forward as time passes. The next question, how effective does it have to be for any treatment to be uh, considered a standard treatment? We need to have an evidence base. At present, we do not have an evidence base, but we can weigh the risks versus benefit. We do know that there is a risk of TACO, 3D, tra trally, transmission transmitted diseases like HIV, Hep B, etc. And in addition to all this, there is also a possibility of an antibody dependent enhancement of virus. This is a phenomena in which the anti uh, bodies that are produced for a virus, in this case against uh, COVID-19, since they're non-neutralizing, uh, so when, when they bind to the variable S domain, they can potentially uh, enable an alternative infection pathway via FC receptor mediated uptake. So antibody dependent enhancement is a potentially harmful consequence of convalescent plasma as well as for hyperimmune immunoglobulin therapy for COVID-19. So the, for any treatment to be clinically relevant, it should be at least 25% effective. Um, but below that, obviously, it cannot come into um, clinical practice. Therefore, um, even if we are using plasma therapy for um, a select group of patients, it has to be at least 25% effective. And um, we will see whether the data proves that. So this is just a cartoon diagram to show how um, COVID-19 virus uh, can uh, cause anti antibody mediated enhancement of the virus. 
because when the virus attaches to the FC receptor, um, what uh, we are proposing that if you are giving an antibody and it neutralizes the virus, then it should not promote the cytokine storm and the pro-inflammatory um, uh, response. However, if this antibody is not a neutralizing antibody, it will attach to the virus, but rather than dampening the immune response, it will enhance the cytokine storm and this can mediate further infection. Now let's talk about how can we get the donors and who, what is the eligibility criteria for people to donate plasma. First of all, to be a donor for plasma, uh, convalescent plasma, a person should be confirmed COVID-19 and for that they should have a PCR and depending on your center, whether you're doing a nasopharyngeal or blood, in our center as, as uh, in the rest of the country, the nasopharyngeal swab PCR is being done. So you should have a person, a, a recovered patient who was uh, diagnosed and confirmed with the PCR. Alternative, uh, alternatively, AABB and certain countries are proposing that they can have an antibody test confirmed, but preferred uh, choice is a PCR um, confirmed uh, person. The, the donor should be asymptomatic for a minimum of 28 days prior to donation. However, if the patient uh, person who is donating uh, is somewhere between 14 days uh, to 27 days, then they can have a follow up PCR. And if that is negative, then 14 days asymptomatic will also make them eligible uh, to be a donor. If there have been more than 28 days, then there is no uh, test required. However, again, depending on your facility, you, your facility might apply more stringent criteria and you might um, require another PCR. Uh, as for uh, FDA and AAB guidelines, if the 28 days have passed and the patient is asymptomatic, they do not require another negative test. Convalescent plasma donors may donate every 28 days as permitted by the allergenic donor eligibility criteria. Now, in addition, we, are, we need to know what is the antibody titer. This is the question where the efficacy of plasma therapy becomes questionable. For convalescent plasma donation, rapid antibody tests for IgG is sufficient. However, the measurement of neutralizing antibody is um, not available in all centers. What is proposed by the AAB and the rest of the transfusion uh, services guidelines is that you should have an ant neutralizing antibody titer of at least 1 to 160. Uh, 1 to 80 may be considered acceptable uh, if an alternative matched unit is not available. But when measurement of the neutralizing antibody comes um, to question, it is not available everywhere. And uh, in that case, if you are to proceed with um, donation and storage of the, uh, of the donation, you may take a sample and uh, store it uh, for future purposes once you have the test available. Another thing to note is that uh, male donors are preferred because of uh, allo immunization risk. Females are deferred, particularly the ones uh, who are multiparous. If females are to be donors, they should be nulliparous or it should be negative for HLA antibodies. So uh, when a donor comes for collection, what are we collecting? The, we, use, we collect a plasma unit just like um, uh, a regular plasma uh, donation as uh, with the A for research machine, you can collect multiple units of plasma, you can store them as a, as a 600 or 900 mil bag or small units of 200 mil bag. They can um, uh, be, the ones that are collected, they should be, they should be properly labeled as per uh, the local and uh, international guidelines. So how do you get that once in uh, the plasma in the hospital? If you have a blood transfusion center or a, a blood bank with you, you will obviously uh, have it with you. Uh, otherwise, you the, there the different methods of uh, supplying the plasma uh, to different hospitals. For the blood bank, this is not any different product apart from the fact that it is just labeled as a convalescent plasma product. However, for the hospitals, it is an experimental product and it should be dealt as an experimental product. You need an IRB approval from the local facility as well as from the national facilities and the local and the national facilities have to uh, work out the guidelines for that. What is the dose? Again, there is no right answer to that. 
uh, 200 mils is what is what is being used all over the world. But uh, in certain trials, for example, in Muir and MD Anderson, they do allow 200 to 400 mils. So you can have one unit or two units. But is it enough or not? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Who should receive it? Again, is it when is the right time to give the plasma therapy? Is it early on in the infection when the person has mild symptoms or is it only reserved for the patients who have severe uh, illness and are ICU or ventilator um, candidates? There, again, the answer is it might be effective in the most sick patient, but it might be not because once the patient is an ICU or ventilator candidate, there's so many other things happening that at that stage, plasma therapy alone might not be um, uh, um, helpful. Is prophylaxis uh, better or not? The answer to that uh, is probably from the previous infections that um, um, SARS-1 and MERS, where uh, the evidence was that convalescent plasma is most effective, effective when it is administered shortly after the symptom onset, onset typically within the two weeks. But this cannot be completely translated into the current um, uh, situation. The study from the Wuhan um, uh, showed the, the time period when the convalescent plasma was given to the effect. And based on that single study, the clinical improvement was approximately 10 days if it, if it was given in the first one to four weeks. And if it was given later on, um, uh, then uh, that is more than eight weeks into the infection, then the effectiveness is much reduced. So, but despite that, we have to prioritize uh, which patients do we give plasma therapy uh, or not. Since this is an experimental studies, most of the centers, including uh, our local centers, um, agree uh, to the fact that the moderately severe or severe life-threatening COVID-19 Patients are the ones who should receive it, and the moderate disease will be defined uh, based on the ICU criteria that they have the shortness of breath, the respiratory uh, rate is more than 30 per minute, arterial um, blood sats are less than 92%, or they develop lung infiltrates, which increase by 25% in the last 24 to 48 hours if their PAO2 or FIO2 ratio is less, over FIO2 ratio is less than 250. So these are the patients who are moderate to severe and they can have plasma therapy. Uh, the severe life-threatening disease will be defined as those who are in respiratory failure, who are in shock, or who have multi-organ dysfunction, and these are the typical IC candidates. So uh, what will be the monitoring uh, that we need to see the response? There are different clinical parameters, different trials are using um, different parameters, but more or less, most of them have these parameters to assess the response. That is whether you have normalization of your fever, uh, dyspnea symptoms resolution, whether you come off the ventilator or not, whether your uh, PAO2 or FIO2 ratio uh, is improved. Then again, uh, the lab parameters like CBC, renal function, liver function, CRP, D dimers, ferritin, procalcitonin, uh, antibody titers, they can be repeated at um, day zero, day five, and so forth. Extra changes, if there is an improvement um, or there's complete resolution, this will be another um, parameter to look for. Now I will talk about the few um, studies or uh, publications that we have so far. Uh, the Cochrane Library Review, uh, which was end May, early uh, June, um, it, this is a study which where they have combined all the possible available completed studies of which seven are the ones that are prospectively planned single arm intervention studies and uh, with a local with a total of 32 participants. Most studies that were assessed by the Cochrane Library were um, uh, single arm studies and um, they did not uh, report um, a huge amount of adverse events um, and uh, the, 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 the final result of the Cochrane Library review is that we have not actually uh, identified um, uh, with certainty uh, whether this is safe to give. Uh, and all these studies have a high risk of bias and reporting quality is quite low. 
So the study outcomes in the Cochrane interview studies um, uh, were the pri primary outcome was mortality uh, at hospital discharge and the time to death. The secondary outcomes was uh, whether they required oxygen, uh, whether they require non invasive ventilation, whether they require ECMO, and again, 30 day and 90 day mortality even after discharge, and the time to discharge uh, from the hospital. So, this is the table uh, which shows the, uh, the um, certainty of evidence of effectiveness of fungus and plasma in all these uh, studies. And as you can see um, in this table, the mortality, the improvement of clinical symptoms or uh, grade three adverse events, serious adverse events. The final conclusion for all these is that the certainty for this is very low. So we cannot be certain whether this is effective based on this review. This table, this tells for uh, the, uh, the effect on the days of discharge after convalescent plasma. Again, there is a variable. Some have the 18 days, some have a 33 day period. So again, we, we, we cannot conclude anything uh, from these uh, studies, whether it affects the days of discharge. Intensive care, uh, care ICU stay after convalescent plasma, out in these seven studies again, whether they, the, the ICU stay was um, decreased we cannot say with any certainty whether this had any uh, uh, improvement. The serious adverse events, there were no serious grade three or grade, grade four adverse events reported in most of the studies. There is only one anaphylactic shock that has been reported in um, PEI 2020 study. However, uh, there hasn't been any serious adverse events. It's for that reason that this practice is still continuing. The single center Wuhan China study, which had 1,568 participants, uh, this is the this, this is the only study which uh, does give some promise and uh, was the basis of um, uh, the advertisement, as you can say, for the plasma therapy um, initiation. Uh, according to this study, the median time from the first symptom um, was 45 days. 2.2% and 4.1% of the cases died in CPT group and in the standard treatment group. Similarly, um, the, the number of patients, the percentage of the patients that were admitted to the IC were 2.4 uh, and 5.1%. Uh, and 70% uh, of the patients who had severe respiratory symptoms got improved and removed oxygen support within seven days after the plasma therapy. Notably, for the patients who received the convalescent plasma therapy within seven weeks after the symptom onset, the median time from the plasma therapy to the clinical improvements was approximately 10 days. But the time to clinical improvement was significantly pro prolonged for patients who received the therapy uh, later than seven weeks after onset. So this study, this particular study, did give some hope that plasma therapy can improve um, the patient by decreasing their oxygen um, requirement. And again, if it is delayed down into the treatment that it did not have as much effect as it would have if, if it was going on early on in the treatment. There is another publication in uh, ASH Blood Journal uh, recently. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, from six centers in the United States, and uh, this is just a summary of the, the six uh, centers where the plasma therapy was used. And if you can see the difference between the convalescent plasma arm and the control arm, there is no much difference between um, the temperature that is bringing down the fever or in the lymphocyte count or in the CRP. In fact, ob obviously, as opposed to the control arm, the CRP was much higher and the lymphocyte variation was much more in the convalescent plasma arm. Similarly, FiO2, there is no great, um, uh, there's no significant difference. Uh, the peak expiratory pressures, the the plateau pressure and the minute ventilation from these graphs between the convalescent plasma, uh, convalescent plasma and control groups in the United States, we haven't seen any significant difference. So based on these the, the, China, the Wuhan study, the United States studies and the print view uh, and another one again, the, the JAMA publication, which is again from China, the the, this was in uh, few centers across China. 
The conclusion for this was that among patients with severe or life-threatening COVID-19 convalescent plasma, added to the standard treatment compared to the standard treatment alone did not significantly improve the time to clinical improvement within 28 days. So where, what do we uh, do from now on? The take home message will, will be that this is still an experimental therapy. It is not something that is completely forbidden or prohibited because based on the previous pandemics and the early Chinese results, uh, there might be a uh, the pro uh, might be promising for a certain group of patients, uh, but um, the, the Cochrane rapid review with eight very small studies shows the effectiveness and safety of the plasma for people with COVID-19 are uncertain. There were no uh, completed randomized control trials to include, but the review authors found 48 ongoing studies, including 22 randomized control trials. So I would conclude by saying that once we have the result of these randomized controlled trials and uh, outcome of the 48 ongoing studies in the world, then probably we can make uh, come to some consensus whether this is uh, certainly effective or not. So we have to watch the space and uh, if you are using it to continue using it as an experimental therapy and with the ICU uh, add the COVID-19 physicians uh, on board, um, defining uh, indications whether you want to give it to the very sick patients or more to the sick patients. Thank you very much. Uh, I must thank all the attendees and especially the speakers for uh, getting this time and making this event a success. So we have a few questions. Uh, first one is, I would like, I would request Professor Tahir, Dr. Tahir Aziz to answer that, although Dr. Ramina has touched upon it. Once immunity developed, for how long it will remain there in the body? And the reactive antibody test in those who have recovered does it really truly indicate protective immunity? Right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the duration of uh, immunity. Uh, well, um, uh, we we have a limited experience, and uh, as few studies come out, and uh, uh, they have followed the antibody levels over a period of time, and. Uh, these studies indicate that uh, in most patients, the antibodies, uh, antibody levels tend to go down quickly within two months. Uh, so in most of the patients, the antibody levels are down uh, within six months to a year. Uh, does that correlate with immunity? That's the question because uh, antibodies are one thing and uh, out of antibodies, we are looking for neutralizing antibodies. But we know that uh, effective immunity would largely depend on presence of virus-specific cytotoxic cells. Now, these studies need to be carried out that uh, whether we have long-lasting immunity or not, we are into seven months uh, of this pandemic, and uh, we, we need to find out those answers. Uh, but one thing would be that uh, it's the, the reinfection is extremely rare, at least uh, at the time of this, uh, uh, at this time, uh, so, so in, in seven months, few months of follow up for patients, uh, what we find is that PCR has become posit positive again for about 100 or so patients, but not the reinfection. The reinfection is extremely rare. But uh, to answer the question, we don't have precise data uh, to, uh, to provide a clear cut answer. But it seems that if immunity is produced, uh, it is likely to be long lasting, but we need to back it up uh, with experimental data. Okay, thank you very much. 
next question, two questions actually are from Dr. Sabine. So the first one is patients who are home isolated, how should they infect, disinfect the room when isolation ends and with what agent? And the second question, okay, you can answer this and then I'll ask the second question, specifically from with Dr. Sabine. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, those patients who are uh, in home isolation, uh, so the basic principle is the same as I mentioned. Um, they need to use a surface disinfectant that covers enveloped viruses. And we know for SARS-CoV-2, the best is bleach. So bleach, uh, you can get household bleach at a concentration of about 5% and you dilute it to 0.1% and uh, uh, with a one minute contact time and uh, for high touch surfaces and uh, including uh, your washroom and toilet facilities. So these are the high touch surfaces that we uh, require and terminal cleaning um, after you know washing down with detergent any dirty areas because bleach would not be affected if it is used on dirt. So you need to actually clean the room or wash it down with a detergent and then apply the bleach solution and um, uh, which areas would you disinfect? So mostly we would focus on high touch surfaces uh, like, for example, chairs or desks or um, and secondly, uh, you should wash down your, uh, you know, the toilets with the bleach and uh, then there are the soft surfaces or laundry. So uh, laundering, uh, as I mentioned, um, up in hot water uh, up to 60 degrees um, and uh, with detergent that should be enough. And um, if there's been any spills or something that you cannot, which is disposable, you could dispose that off. So basically, and also ventilating the room is very important that you open all the win windows and uh, make sure that enough sunlight and ventilation comes in. So that should suffice for, you know, um, we know that uh, the virus survival on surfaces is variable. So within, say, it, can, it would not likely survive more than seven days. Right, right. So the next question from Dr. Sabine again, a patient with COVID-19 who recovered with two negative PCR 24 hours apart after two weeks of infection, again has positive PCR after four weeks. Is this reinfection? If not, why were the two PCRs positive, uh, two PCRs post recovery negative? So uh, to answer, answer this question is we need to take in the clinical context of the patient um, at the time. Uh, first of all, why were they retested after having two negative PCRs? Did they develop any symptoms? Was there a cause for concern? Are they immunocompromised? And where did they get the testing done from? Is it a different labs or the same labs? So these are some certain questions we need to answer here. So as far as reinfection data is concerned, um, there was a Korean cohort, the South Korean cohort, in which there were certain uh, patients who were negative in between interim and came back positive. But what they uh, actually concluded was that they did not detect viable or culturable virus. And actually the uh, previous negative results were probably due to some uh, sample collection issue or uh, because uh, there was something wrong with the PCR technique or free analytical factors. Um, so I would, you know, um, as Brigadier Tahir Aziz mentioned that reinfection so far, you know, um, this is quite early, we're early into the pandemic and we need to look at more data for that. And we need to, for this particular patient in which they've asked the question, I'd like to know whether this patient is immunosuppressed because we know that immunosuppressed patients can shed respiratory viruses for prolonged periods. And again, whether the testing they did previously was from the same lab or from a different lab. Okay. Okay. So next so question, next. Three, three or four questions are from Dr. Bushra, or a clinical hematologist. So first is what is the antibody cutoff to be eligible for plasma donation? You want to respond by yeah. that one? So uh, according to the FDA and uh, AABB, the antibody cutoff or the title of the antibody that they recommend is one ratio 160 and if you cannot have if you have more than one donated plasma um, donation then it, you can even go with one ratio 80 this is the minimum but again 
it depends upon the type of testing that you have available. Most of the centers locally and worldwide do not have the titration ability and they are using crude methods to determine the titer or they're not doing it and saving the samples for future to, to test uh, the titer once the tests are available. But uh, the, the simple answer to that is the cutoff that they have recommended is one ratio 160 and uh, a minimum of one to 80. May I ask a question? Uh, Dr. Kassel? So you want to respond, Professor? Sir? Okay, fine. Uh, I have a question uh, directed at uh, Dr. Busha's presentation. Is it possible? May I ask or should I say? Yeah, sure, please. Yes, you can ask, please. Right. Um, uh, Dr. Busha, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, for plasma therapy, the underlying concept is that the plasma would have neutralizing antibodies. Yes. So uh, it is important that uh, this kind of therapy is used uh, in the phase of disease where we want to uh, limit the infection of viruses or interaction of viruses with the target cells. Uh, that would be the initial phase of the disease, not the late and severe disease, uh, yes. where uh, because in that, in that particular phase of disease, the most of the damage is caused by immune response and not by the cytopathic effect of viruses yeah. any. So early phase of disease. So I would like to point out in your second last slide showing the uh, details of Wuhan study for yes. CP therapy. Uh, you, you, you showed that it was used in patients seven weeks after the infection. I think yes. that, that, yeah. that may not be right. It, 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 it should be either five or seven days after infection yeah. or neutral, neutralizing antibodies to be effective. Yeah. So uh, the, that second, the second last slide of from the Wuhan study, that the, I think it was his last point on it. That's exactly what you were saying, that their result was that if it was used early on for those patients, they did uh, uh, get the a desired response, the oxygen requirement was decreased. And in those that were given the treatment after uh, seven weeks, the, the effect was minimal. That's what that, that study showed. And as you mentioned, the data which we have is from SARS-CoV-1 infection and MERS uh, infection. In those uh, pandemics, they used the plasma therapy early on. The, the, the result was that it is only effective if, if it was used early on in the infection, infective time period. But the problem now is that this COVID-19 infection, because it, most of the patients, 80% of the patients probably, will recover anyways. So when they are in their mild or in their early phase, uh, since it's an experimental therapy, you cannot make it a, a suggestion that all of them should have the plasma therapy. And for that reason only, once they are, because all the centers are using it as an experimental therapy, they have to come up, come up with some prioritization criteria. And to justify the use of it, um, most of the trials, including in America and here, they have, they have uh, asked for the plasma therapy in severe or in mild, moderate, depending on clinician discretion. Uh, but you are right, the effect effectiveness of this has only be, been proven in the previous pandemics if it was used early on. But now it is very hard to say that everybody who has COVID-19 should have it early on in the treatment because of the potential uh, damages and the adverse events. Thank you very much. Uh, well, just a supplemental question, if you allow kindly, please. Um, the plasma itself um, from different donors uh, as you said, uh, it's not likely to have the same kind of antibodies or same level of antibodies. Uh, so to be effective, this therapy, uh, if you want to have studies, then you have to have a homogenized product to be assessed. So yes. Um, yes. if you have cool plasma thing, uh, where you have clearly defined the neutralizing antibody levels and then yes. use it in studies, then you're likely to have some kind of results. And then yes. the very rationale that it is highly unlikely to be effective, if at all, in the severe disease or even moderate levels, then yeah. Yeah. The, everything falls apart for the CP therapy uh, for uh, for the argument that it is likely to be effective in early phase of disease. Uh, I most, agree. 
most of the patients would have mild or moderate disease anyway or subclinical disease 80% yeah. of them so it, it it would be interesting to create this uh, unified product or homogenized product yeah. in sufficient volumes and then use it to uh, say uh, decrease the pe uh, period from pcr positive to pcr negative so yeah. something irrational on those lines and not uh, actually going in in the severe disease as actually uh, it was uh, uh, recommended in, uh, by the earlier cdc guidelines or who guidelines where the rational was completely flawed in severe disease it is like fresh frozen plasma you are providing uh, the coagulation factor it may promote the so what you have just uh, done with the so many uncontrolled studies just to show that it was not a bad form of therapy not causing yeah. so many adverse effects that just that nothing about effectiveness and we are talking all the time we i mean proverbial we uh, in pakistan that thousands of patients are being uh, kind of cured if we can use that word uh, and the plasma being sought after by so many patient desperate relatives um, even selling of plasma so it's completely unscientific it's a jungle out there with uh, these unscientific recommendations coming from uh, reputable centers so i would like that uh, we yes. must come out with a clear message Thank yes you i agree 100% that it's for that reason that the studies so far which were non randomized control trials there were sin single center experiences they have not shown that it is uh, they have shown that it does not cause severe adverse effects but it has not shown that it is uh, safely effective either and 48 or so studies and the randomized control trials their results are still to come and we are watching the space but as we stand for the moment it uh, we cannot advocate uh, it to be used willy nilly just like people are these days uh, because it will cause more harm than uh, benefit and as you said a properly designed study where it is used early on in the treatment uh, in a con in a, which has been approved by irb local and uh, um, uh, government level only then we should be uh, advocating its use totally agree Thank you very much. Okay, a uh, few more questions regarding this plasma therapy. Since PCR might remain positive for up to six weeks, can someone donate plasma who has recovered but PCR positive is positive at four weeks? The second one is related to it. Data from Yuhan is showing early use of clonopolysal plasma. If yes, locally we are using for severely ill patients. Why? and does this uh, therapy depends on the length of the disease or severity of the disease yes so as far as the pcr is concerned the guidelines uh, that have the who uh, fda aab they have uh, recommended then if you are asymptomatic uh, 14 days and you want to donate then you should have a pcr that is negative if your pcr is still positive and it's only you only had you've been asymptomatic uh, for 14 days and you cannot donate however if you are asymptomatic for 28 days or more then you do not need a negative test but again with the caveat that each local facility can have its own stringent um, uh, pre testing criteria because safety is a huge issue not only for the donors for the recipients for the uh the local staff etc cetera, etc cetera. so it the, the, there might be more stringent um uh, pre donation requisites from different centers and they might not accept you as a donor if your pcr is positive even if you are 3 months i mean more than 28 asymptomatic because the the actual requirement is uh 14 days asymptomatic and a pcr negative and more than 28 days you could donate theoretically but again your local facility will decide uh, will decide whether they want to take that uh risk or not and as far as the you as you said that in wuhan uh, it was uh, we just discussed in detail just uh, in the previous question that yes in wuhan the the effectiveness was shown uh, early on in the treatment and when you have this wide scale pandemic where, where patients uh, people are getting effect, infected uh, in in a country like ours it it's when you're not even being treated or you don't have a place or a, a proper facility uh, where you're willing to go in mild or early on disease to advocating using plasma at that stage will will it will not be appropriate since patients 
the, the cohort of the patients that most of us will see in the hospitals will be moderate to severe. Therefore, the, the, the usage of plasma is being a direct towards those. If there was a way to properly have a controlled uh, audit and a, 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 the follow up of the milder patients, then yes, early on in the in the treatment, we could we could probably see more benefit provided the plasma was safe. Uh, Dr. Busha, may, may I, uh, with PCR positive, just plain one recommendation, do not donate. That is all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. OK. OK, I think we are also short of time, so we might take a couple of questions which are from Dr. Rumina. So the first question for you, Dr. Rumina, is which PCR test uh, kit is being used at SKMCH? And I got that SKM is using rdrp based PCR testing. And Dr. Sava also mentioned that E-based test is most sensitive, but she also said that E-protein is not specific for COV-2. So the result, RDP, RDPCR or E-based, which one is to follow? And the third, okay, I'll ask this later. Okay, so in SKIM, in our lab, we use mostly automation, as I mentioned earlier. It's uh, COBA 6800 uh, kits that use uh, in our lab. Uh, which has uh, two targets. One is uh, RF1 gene and the other one is E gene. And the, according to the company's interpretation, if both genes are positive, then the result report is positive. If E gene is negative and RD, sorry, ORF1 is positive, then the patient is positive. So that tells you that E gene is a parent gene as not specific for um, um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so they have, because it is used as a screening, even now it is used as a screening test. Therefore, it just tells, for example, there is there are situations where the patients, they are target one negative, like ORF1 negative, but E gene positive. So the company recommends that we call them presumptive positive. That means that they can be positive for SARS, they can be positive for MERS, they can be positive for SARS-CoV-2. But because it's pandemic, therefore, it has to be SARS-CoV-2 and not the others. See, in pandemic situation, the interpretation changes. If it was SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2, everything in the, in the air, then we could say that it could be any one of them. But because it's pandemic with SARS-CoV-2 only, therefore, if even E gene is positive and the other target, which is more specific for uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is ORF1 negative, still we call them positive, the presumptive positive, but positive. So, so we use uh, Roche to answer your question. Secondly, we do have other uh, manual test uh, kits that we have validated and they have different uh, targets, but mostly um, uh, because of the um, you know, pandemic and the situation we wanted to do Quick, rep, quick testing and reporting and not wasting time for the patients and for the clinicians to make decisions. So we are doing mostly uh, the automation. Second question. Second question was, sorry. Okay, so I have uh, responded to the e-gene and the, um, the RDRP is uh, not the one that we use in Roche, but yes, in other manual kits, we do have RDRP one, but I'm not using those kits anymore. Uh, maybe two more questions. One question from Dr. Sabine. Is it true that PCR detects specific proteins even if they are in fragmented or dead virus state? If yes, how long does it take for those dead fragments to disappear? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, so basically, um, what is PCR? It's detecting a genetic uh, target, right? Which is the virus, uh, as already explained, various multiple targets. So when you're detecting these genetic targets, and depending on your essay, two or more targets, perhaps only one, you're, it's actually telling you that SARS-CoV-2 genetic material is present there. It's not really giving you any information whether this is live virus. But we know that in the beginning of the infection, uh, by the methodology that we are using in our lab, which is real-time reverse transcript-based PCR, we are using uh, you know, a fluorescence-based method. 
and uh, we detect the target. Uh, the earlier we detect it, uh, the uh, lower number of cycles it is uh, of the PCR amplification. So that sort of gives us a rough idea that this is actually a high viral, although it's not absolutely quantification, but it tells us that if something is detected at say 21 cycles threshold, we know that it's actually quite presumably a high viral load. But if something is detected around 38 cycles, it's probably, it could be, you know, uh, somebody who's in recovery phase or um, in terms of the, there have been studies and there uh, papers published uh, correlating virus viability with the cycle thresholds. And there was one paper that was out uh, which concluded that at a cycle threshold of 35 and above, viable virus was not cultured. But then there's a caveat over here because when we're taking viral culture, it's actually uh, the sensitivity of viral culture may not be that great. So to answer this question is that uh, yes, when you have a positive PCR, uh, depending on the cycle threshold, it may not be live virus, but this is not an absolute. It depends on many factors, the types of essays you're using, the way the sample was collected. So this has to be interpreted in the clinical context. So it, say in a clinical scenario, there's a person who's immunocompetent, who's recovered, after 15 days or so, they get themselves, they're getting persistent PCR positivity. Although, you know, in UK, they did away with the um, uh, testing strategy. They never did it. Uh, they only applied the retesting strategy for patients for de-isolation for immunocompromise or maybe healthcare workers. Really, they didn't uh, do it for everybody like we did in the beginning. So because it really caused a lot of confusion. So my answer would be that you need to interpret this in the co clinical context, plus also the result, the cycle threshold. And um, we've, we've got more data coming out on that. So uh, obviously, uh, PCR does not mean absolutely that it's a live virus that you're detecting. So it could be fragments or could, could be not. After that, if anybody wants to ask questions, we will just let's post the email addresses of the speakers and we can ask them. So, last two questions Why is the innate immunity weaker in some patients, leading to a more severe disease and worse outcome? And the second one I would ask to like, uh, like to ask Is there any test to measure neutralizing antibodies? Professor Tahir Aziz, please. Right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, uh, the innate immune response and uh, uh, two things here. The initial uh, critical component is production of interferons. A timely production, uh, early phase, and production in sufficient levels. That ensures uh, minimizing the number of viruses uh, which are available for infecting the uh, surrounding cells. So, um, uh, as we know that uh, uh, with the advancement in age, uh, this, this is just physiologically uh, the uh, components of immune system uh, uh, respond uh, in a relatively less intense manner. Um, so the infections tend to progress quickly. The, uh, um, uh, the infections tend to take hold relatively easily uh, in, uh, in say individuals who are uh, 60 years or older uh, and it, it, it would really depend on the under, underlying uh, general health and the presence of comorbids because probably uh, the presence of comorbids uh, with advancing age uh, would uh, produce a, a, a kind of immunosuppressed state earlier for some people uh, then uh, people of the same age who are still 60 years plus but uh, don't have comorbids, their immune system is likely to be in a better shape. So uh, this is just a very general kind of response that uh, if you are in maintaining a good health, um, taking uh, 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 um, kind of moderate exercise, uh, having a balanced diet, uh, that would ensure a better response from the immune system. But the immune system alone is not enough. It is the infecting dose. And uh, at the time of infecting dose, uh, what kind of stress levels uh, were you having? Because in one of my studies, uh, I studied uh, immune response. Uh, that was activation of neutrophils and antibody levels in uh, 
um, in attendance of the uh, uh, patients uh, uh, during the time of Kashmir uh, earthquake. And uh, uh, those attendants were healthy, but they were in a lot of stress. And I showed that their neutrophils were not being activated as efficiently, though they were in the younger age group. So the stress level, the comorbids, and the advancing age. Uh, would compromise the immune system to some extent, and the infecting dose is also important. So that is one. Uh, the, what was the other question, please? Is there any test to measure neutralizing antibody? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, the the test is uh, very much there, but it is carried out in uh, in labs where uh, they can show that uh, after uh, uh, treatment with the uh, specimen of plasma where antibodies are supposed to be there. Uh, uh, the, uh, the treatment of live viruses with this uh, plasma or serum specimen uh, leads to uh, less infection, less cytopathic effect uh, in viral culture. So that would uh, require a very uh, advanced laboratory facility where this virus could be handled perhaps BSL-3 or higher, um, uh, something like uh, which existed in Wuhan. So it's not uh, an undertaking which uh, uh, could be uh, taken on uh, by laboratories which are not having these facilities. So neutralizing uh, antibodies test is available, available, but only in centers with, uh, with, with BSL-3 or higher capabilities. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So this is it probably. Um, thank you very much for all the speakers and attendants for making this a success. And I would wish you a happy remaining weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.